Have we started? Yes? Yep. Okay, you're breaking up. Good evening, everyone. I am Pat Moore, the chair of quality of life and service delivery committee for CB1. My co-chair is Miriama James, our district manager is Lucian Reynolds. And if you're if you can see us, the committee is before you. So we're going to start out tonight. <clears throat> Mariama is going to take the lead. She's got a reso that she's bringing to our committee. Go ahead, Mariama. Thank you, Pat. Yes, we have a 9-11 health care correction funding bill or funding correction bill. Um, we spoke about this last month and many other times. Um, uh, over the past year at this committee that there is a shortfall in the amount of funding for uh, the health care program, which World Trade Center health care program that stems from. Really, it's optimism. People just had in the original planning didn't account for the number of, of cancer cases that would arise uh, and that have unfortunately um, you know, arisen. So with the amount of money that had been set forth originally, the program was going to have to begin to start turning people away in 2024. Um, Senator um, Chuck Schumer and, and, and Kirsten Gillibrand fixed that to the extent that we now have until 2027 with the health care program, but obviously our leadership would like to fund it through 2090 as it's supposed to be. Um, and so our congressman is a co-sponsor on that bill and has um, been gracious enough to send Aaron from his office to make a presentation on that bill for us tonight. Yes, Aaron, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I really uh, great to be here with you. Um, but yep, I'm Aaron Megan. I'm Congressman Goldman's uh, deputy chief of staff and legislative director here in DC, um, and I'm your point of contact um, for information about this bill. Um, but yes, the congressman is really proud to not only be co-sponsoring but co-leading this effort. Um, he is a co-lead on the bill, which means he's helping get other members on, helping educate other members about the bill. But um, that was a, a great, you know, introduction to just um, the very top lines of the bill, which I think we all know. But um, right now. Now, you know, the program has funding for a couple more years, um, but then it will be running out. And obviously that's unacceptable. We need to fully fund it. Um, and, you know, the reasons behind that are just there was a lot more people who um, were sick and were um, uh, seriously ill than, than anticipated. So that's why the program, you know, um, we've had to do this a couple times now, put more money into the program. Um, at the end of last year, Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand were able to secure that money to get us to, you know, 2027, perhaps even 2028, depending on, you know, how much, how much need there is. Um, but this bill, you know, ensures that it's fully funded, ensuring it ensures that we're really taking care of, of everyone we need taken care of. Um, so what I'll do is I will put in the chat um, um, a great resource, which is from our website that kind of um, explains the bill and, and hopefully answers some questions. Um, I also did add my email to the chat, but it's looking like it's just saying I'm adding to the chat. I'm only sharing it with it privately. So I hope everyone can see that. Let me know if not. Turn but. it around make sure everyone gets it. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, but yes, this bill is so important and um, we're really um, working hard to get more and more co-sponsors. I think that's really the key. Um, and what is, um, you know, I think so important that um, we've done and working closely with the advocates like Ben Shabbat um, to really prioritize getting a lot of bipartisan co-sponsors. So, you know, you all may know, but I'll just talk a little bit about how, you know, this used to be, um, you know, led by a Democrat. And this year, it, because the House of Representatives is um, is led by uh, a Republicans now, um, it is now a Republican um, who is leading the bill. And so we're really, you know, it, I think that's a great, you know, show of support to say, look, at, at the end of the day, it does. it's not about who's getting credit, right? It doesn't matter that it's a Democratic bill or a Republican bill. What matters is that we're coming together to get it across the finish line. And obviously, bipartisanship is needed here because we've got a Republican House and a, and a, and a Senate that's led by led by Democrats, and we both need to come together and pass this bill. Um, so, so far, um, we have um, about 40 co-sponsors and working to add more every day. Um, so we're working really closely with um, Congressman Nadler and our Republican colleagues, um, Republicans from New York, including uh, Mr. Garbarino, um, who's one of the leaders on this as well, to make sure that we're, we're getting the bill past this Congress. Um, it's really not acceptable that we're continuing to, you know, put this program under pressure um, and have people worried that they may not get the support and medical care that they need. Um, so I think that's really um, the main crux of it in terms of, you know, next steps. Really, we're just continuing to 
add co-sponsors, make sure you know we're getting more and more people to support the bill, um, and then we'll continue to pressure um, leaders who would be in charge of deciding if the bill gets to the floor. And so obviously the, the main person is, is Speaker McCarthy, so continuing to pressure him to make sure that he's actually putting this on the floor and working closely with Republican colleagues to make sure that we're doing that. Um, and obviously, Senator Schumer and Gillibrand, it's Senator Gillibrand's bill um, over in the Senate. She's pushing hard and we'll continue to you know, work closely with her office on this as well. But I'm happy to take any questions or anything else I can add. I have a question and then I see Justine has one. Are there any states in particular where we should be contacting friends and family asking them to reach out to their representatives? You know, I think really the target is just any Republican member, you know, at the end of the day, unfortunately, it's just the House of Representatives is the Republicans are in charge. And so they decide. And so I think if you have any friends or family who live in a Republican district who can get help get their member of Congress on, that's really what's going to make a difference here. Um, you know, if we can get 50 Republicans on or 100 Republicans on um, that, I think it's what it's going to take to get it to the floor to for McCarthy to see that there's a lot of support for this. Um, and then I think the second step would be, you know, once those Republicans are a co-sponsor, kind of the second step to pressure them is to say, okay, thank you for co-sponsoring, but, you know, now we want you to, you know, not only co-sponsor, but also reach out to McCarthy and let him know this is a priority. You're not just co-sponsoring this bill. You really care about it. You really want to see it on the floor. Please ask him to put it on the floor. Justine? Thanks so much. Um, I want to say thank you, first of all, Erin, and thank you for to to uh, a Goldman for doing this because this is so important. It is so huge that this is it is so necessary. Um, and yeah, echoing what what Mar Mariama asked and what you just said is like we need to speak to our relatives and friends who are Republicans to get them to sign on to this because this is a bipartisan issue. People are dying and getting sick and need the help, whether they're Republican, Democrat, independent, doesn't matter. It's a huge issue. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. Yep, we're gonna keep pushing it until we get it done. Absolutely. And, um, you know, uh, we'll keep pushing to get, you know, even a partial win. I mean, obviously we're gonna push till we get this fully funded and it's fully done, but, you know, it was really great to see that Senator uh, Schumer and Senator Gillibrand working together did get a partial win at the end of last year in the big, um, budget bill, the omnibus budget bill that funded the government that we got done in December, you know, they got a billion dollars to get us at least to 2027. And so that is obviously very helpful, um, but we need to get it all the way now. Mimi? Um, thanks for being here. I have been trying to collect um, information about this, uh, just sort of on the sly, because I have a lot of family in red states. Uh, family and friends in red states and if um you have any like easily digestible and distributable uh sort of materials for this that would really help me out because i'm like yeah. too technical to be able to like tell people how to do anything um totally so, that's a great thanks. question yeah i put our um press release in the chat and i think they're going to share that with everybody but i think our press release just does a really good job of just explaining like you know i think i think maybe the pitch to republicans is just you know like this is mainly for first responders right like most of these people are first responders like they're the people we need to be taking care of and that you know you're saying you you know you care about and like this is an opportunity for you to demonstrate that you really care about first responders or their you know loved ones of first responders or people who they may not have been like a first responder but they they volunteered to like be a first responder that day or they just happen to you know live in that area um so i think that's kind of like the main piece and then you know i think the press release does a nice job of almost like being your talking points for talking to family and friends in in those um those red districts where it kind of goes through and talks about you know how much support there is for this right so you know like the international association of firefighters this is a major priority for them um, you know, really these first responders groups um, are really active on this, um, you know, police officers around the country support this, firefighters around the country support this. Um, and, you know, these folks live in, in almost every district, right? They may have at the time lived in New York, but, you know, they, they're everywhere. And, you know, even if they don't have some of these folks in their district, like this is an issue that the nation owes this debt, right? We have to take care of our first responders and people who got sick from this tragedy. Um, so I think those are some of the kind of the main, the main points I would recommend um, using. And what's different about this particular addition to the bill amendment, I guess, so to speak, mm -hmm. is that not only does it cover the area first responders 
from New York, but for the first time, some people that were had been left out, some responders that have been left out in um, Pennsylvania and in DC at the Pentagon are now also being included. In addition to, of course, I mean, we're a neighborhood of survivors mostly. So, you know, there's the survivors and survivors is such a huge umbrella because it is area workers that weren't first responders, but they still worked here. It is residents, it is students. In some cases it's visitors and tourists even, you know, depends upon uh, one circumstance. So. As you said, everybody in every I mean, every state is impacted by this somehow. And at this point, mm -hmm. there is a World Trade Center health program, whether it is um, one of the centers of excellence that's a standalone building, a hospital you can enter, a clinic, or it's some a doctor that's in the network. This is in every state in the union at this point, um, because we have people that you know retired and and moved around, or again, there were students that didn't live in New York; they were just here temporarily. So. Mm -hmm. Every state is impacted. I'm sorry, uh, Lucian. Thanks, Mariama. Um, I, I just wanted to suggest that, uh, assuming that this resolution passes, and I absolutely am assuming that, um, I, I think that uh, I'd like to work with this group and with Tammy and Alice to form uh, an outreach uh, uh, task force. Um, I think that if uh, CB1 members reach out to uh, members uh, of community boards in districts that have uh, Republican uh, Congress people, such as Staten Island, Deep Queens, uh, et cetera. Um, we, could, we could try to get this in front of their community boards and have their That's community boards advocate directly to them. Uh, mm -hmm. Furthermore, um, you know, I think community boards are, are, are a unique thing, uh, but I think that you all also have the, the juice to speak directly to uh, uh, county officials and, and municipal officials in Long Island or, uh, you know, in other parts of the state um, and uh, pass this along to them as well to try to get them to mm -hmm. also advocate the same to their to their, uh, their representatives. So I think we can all put our heads together and how best to do that, but um, I'm happy to help in that effort. Awesome. Thank you so much for, that, for offering that. Jill? Yeah, hi. Um one thing, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. And of course, thank you to Mariama who went down to Washington and has been fighting for this for since day one, really for, for this. Of course. And one thing I just want to emphasize, and I always do this, is that the survivors, the residents always sort of get pushed back and just to use pure language that we're not as sexy as first responders. Um, and this really bothers me because every single person on this call has been personally and deeply affected by 9-11. Well, there may be not everyone, but almost everyone I, I, that I see personally and deeply affected either personal cancers, their parents, they've lost their loved ones from these cancers. And it's important to keep in mind that the work that the, this does not minimize in any way the first responders by giving equal space to the survivors who basically lived on this site. We were there, we breathed the air, we slept on this site. Our children with their developing lungs breathed that air all night and all day. We are paying the price. I can't tell you how many people on this call I know have had cancer. Um, it does not minimize the great sacrifice that the first responders paid by giving the true effect that this has had on survivors who were told it was safe to come back to this community and are now deeply paying the price. And I beg of you to please remember that and not minimize us. Thank you. Excellent, Jill. Uh, Mitch. Yes, uh, Aaron, I, uh, I would think that, uh, you know, to, to piggyback of what Lucian said, so many of the firemen and uh, policemen that work in New York City live in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. I would think if there was anything that was bipartisan, this would be it. So that well, means- It is bipartisan. Yeah, we do have several right. Republicans on the bill, for it, sure, that, for sure. Because it's not a done deal, there has to be some Republicans or some people that have not voted for it 
um, unless I'm mistaken, are there any prominent Republicans or, or, or elected officials that have, have, have not come on board this yet? Yes. So I will put a link in. Um, so, for example, like, you know, Speaker McCarthy, I think, is the most prominent person we can okay, talk so about. Okay, so about he, that. Yeah, he hasn't expressed now, any support for putting it on the floor. Have you thought, because mm -hmm. some people only get their news from, you know, mm -hmm. in the red from Fox News, or some people only get the news from CNN or this or that, or like right. some type of, like, putting on, on like a, a full page ad in the Washington Post or the New York Times or the 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 Dallas Weekly, what you know, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, with with the names of you know the so-called uh, you know the the MAGA patriots and saying you know like outing them, you know, because the the reddest person in the reddest state would would I mean this is like would would this is like a patriotic thing. So has has you know instead of just like uh, outing them to the to the you know people that already know about that. Yeah, you know, we're working with really we're working really closely with some of the advocates to to continue to brainstorm, you know, how do we get more Republicans to support the bill, right? So we have, you know, a good number, um, but you know, we need more. And we at the end of the day, we need not just take a full page ad out of the New York Post and in papers like that around the country where the, those people read those 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 articles and uh, or on or on, you know, Fox News if you're able to do that. And mm -hmm. and uh, you know, because you know for, for them to come out in public to be shamed and say, you know, we don't want our patriotic policemen, firemen, and, and first responders, uh, you know, to, to get uh, uh, this help, you know, uh, sometimes that, you know, makes them vote differently because they just care about staying in power. And uh, besides, I agree a billion percent with what Jill said, even though I just, yeah. you know, mentioned first responders, but that's sometimes it takes, you know, like a call to a, you know, like like a new uh, channel four to get your uh, your your plumbing fixed when the landlord hasn't responded. You know, for the last ten years, and right. and maybe right. using that type of tactic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, um, I think Ben Shabbat and some of the other you know advocates that we work with, you know, um, they they are all for that. And one thing that we we've worked, you know, they have done in the past, and you know, is like for example, like bring John Stewart, right? Like he's a household name. Um, he right. gets a lot of media coverage. He has come to DC and called out people like you know um, certain Republicans, like it, like previously it was McConnell. I think now it would be appropriate to for McCarthy to say like, why haven't you put this bill on the floor? Like it's been introduced for months yeah. now, and there's some. Republican support for it, clearly, you know, there's Republicans on board. There's not enough Republicans, you know, co-sponsoring it. There could be more. The John certainly. Stewart thing was great, but there are yeah. some people that have blinders on. So if they hear something coming from his mouth, they, they don't want to listen. I'm saying getting some, get, getting to them in their backyard. Yep. I hear you. Yep. I think we're exploring all avenues that we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everything. Of course. Thanks. Thanks. Piggybacking on, on what Mitch said, is there, can you think of anybody um, who might be an icon for um, people in the States, you know, maybe uh, that yes. might be able to reach them? Um, like you said, John Stewart has a, like more of a liberal following. Uh, and I think he's great. I'm very, really grateful, but, you know, I'm just wondering if there's anybody else that you that could be, you, you can use or to reach out to the, to the the country western music star would be perfect yeah yeah i'm all ears if anyone has any suggestions and i'll definitely you know take that back to you know uh mr nadler and mr garbarino and the other members we're working with um but absolutely you know any way we can we can get this done you know we we want to look to that and um you know uh at the end of the day you know i think just just getting that pressure on them um in through different ways right through having you know their own constituents contact them and you know, reporters ask them about it and, um, uh, you know, national media. Maybe the Stephen Siller Foundation Tunnel to Towers people. In That's actually a good idea. They might have somebody. Uh, they had uh, at the last that last event that they had, they had Rudy, Rudy Giuliani as a keynote speaker. Remember that one? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like two years ago, a year or two ago? Uh, last year. Anyway, just to make sure I'm not skipping anybody from the public, right? No? No more questions. Okay. So in that case, did everybody receive the resolution? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to look at it and any questions about the resolution specifically? Any problems with the resolution? 
If not, maybe somebody wants to just call the question. I'll call the question. I'll second it. In second, okay. Solutions brought it up just to make sure everyone's okay with all the wording and everything. Oh, she's always. Yep. Now we know what we're doing. I'll just uh, say that to the public, uh, I put a link in the chat and how to download this. Um, there's also a link off the live the NCB1 to NYC page where you can find draft resolutions uh, for any particular meeting that that link stays static. Uh, so if you want to download this as a PDF, this draft, you can do so. Uh, but otherwise, Mariama, I, I heard the second. And so, uh, Pat, if you want to do the votes, I'm ready to record. All right, so we're going to do what we normally do. <clears throat> if I anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Anyone? What am I missing? Missing one more. Recusing. Recusing. Recusing, exactly. Thank you. If not, then we assume everyone is in favor. Passes okay. unanimously then. Thank you. Erin, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, great to be with you. Okay, we will keep fighting uh, on the bill and um, thank you all so much. Um, I think you've, you've given us some some good ideas to go back and, and brainstorm on our side of the aisle on our side um, with with our, our colleagues here. Um, so thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Yeah. Bye, everybody. I have to thank Mary Ama. She is always fighting for us in this community. She fights for us for affordable housing. She and Jill She is of fighting course. for our health. Mariama, thank you as always. You're very welcome. She needs to run for office. Yes. I did uh, just for uh, We can't talk about that. No, 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 no. We don't talk about that. Right, we're moving on. We're I don't know. I, I said something okay. positive. Next, <laughs> next on our agenda. Well, let me see. Uh, uh, so we're going to ask. The future Southern District of New York office renovation work to do their presentation. So, would you please, who is it, and would you introduce yourself? Anyone else, please mute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we oh, can. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Thanks for uh, uh, letting us come to your meeting to give you a, an overview of our. Uh, we have a project, and it's the reconstruction, like a major renovation of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District. That's the uh, building right down on uh, St. Andrews Plaza by police headquarters and municipal building uh, right by St. Andrews Catholic Church. And, and, what, and who I am, I'm Tom Burke, and I'm with the General Services Administration, GSA, which is a branch of the federal government that owns and operates a lot of the federal buildings in, in the country, sort of equivalent to New York City's DCAS, you know, citywide. Uh, you know, administrative services. And what we have is uh, we wanted to give you a presentation, an overview of our project. But saying that, uh, just to, uh, as background, even though this is an overview of the project, we're still in the process of completing our environmental review under uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Those are the environmental rules the federal, that pertain to the federal government. Similar to the a city quality review, we have a federal, a federal uh, uh, system just like that. And we're in the process of completing the environmental assessment, and we're going to make that available for public review and comment. And we're also uh, going to be scheduling a public meeting uh, for the project as well. And I'm joined along uh, tonight with Scott Elgott, who's our project manager for the project and is much more familiar with it than I am. So I was gonna pass it over to Scott to sort of go through the presentation and give you an idea of what's going on. Okay, thank you again. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Welcome, Scott. Where are you? Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm Scott Elgart. I'm the project manager for the Silvio Malo Federal Building Major Modernization Project. Um, put together a quick presentation just to give you an idea of like, of, of the project, where it's located, and uh, information. Uh, Lucian, you can 
go to the next slide. So basically, we, here's um, the community board one map, and we've kind of shown where one St. Andrews Plaza is, where the model building is located. So this is a view of the coming off the Brooklyn Bridge, and the Silvio Model Building is one of the first buildings you see. It's the brown building right there in the in the thing with the green windows. So that is the, so it has a very uh, visual um, component to it from coming off your first view from the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. Again, this is just a map, kind of an aerial view of where the site is. Next one. And you can see the model buildings in red, and we've kind of highlighted all the buildings around it. You can see the uh, one police plaza in number seven below it. You see the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse, uh, 500 Pearl Street, uh, the Dinkins Municipal Building. So, and then you have the St. Andrew's Church right and adjacent to our, our site, number three. So you can see we're right in the heart of the Municipal Civic Center. Um, so it is a lot of logistics and, and you know, um, things that are going to be affecting our neighbors, which are most of the uh, New York City uh, agencies. Go to the next one. So the project scope is basically our goal is we're demo, 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 demolishing, sorry, the existing building down to the structural slabs and columns. Um, we're going to be doing a complete renovation of the interior and modernizing it. Um, we're going to be installing a new security pavilion outside of the uh, footprint for to keep, you know, to comply with our current security and accessibility requirements. Um, and the other, one of the big things about this project is the building is not full is not access, accessible to the public um, because there's a number of stairs. So it is not we're we're improving uh, the universal accessibility so everyone has the ability to get into the building easily. Um, again, this was going to have a uh, it's a new high performance facade and the building systems are going to achieve lead requirements. We're aiming for lead platinum at this time and looking for uh, net zero carbon certification. Go to the next slide. So kind of what we've been doing so far, we've done a bunch of community engagement, um, which is part of our planning outreach and partnership meetings where we've been having it with all the uh, adjacent neighbors to the building, which includes DCAS, NYPD, um, the St. Andrew's Church, uh, the um, DOT, your, you know, the building department, the, you know, a list of basically every city agency because we are impacting them the most. Um, we started the, we had meetings with the Department of Transportation and the Public Design Commission to talk about some of the uh, things that are, we're doing as far as landscaping and improvements to the plaza, which are considered New York City property. Um, we are also going to be doing a lot of public outreach as part of the NEPA policy that uh, Tom has mentioned. Go to the next one. So this is a view of the building as it stands now, as you can see. Uh, can't really see now, but the, there's a basically a bunch of stairs and uh, a little pavilion um, that they put put up to for screening, and there's a bridge that goes to the building. Go to the next one. So this is a the existing site plan. As you can see, we have the stairs, and then we have a bridge that leads us to the building itself. Go to the next one. This is just showing the area of demolition, the area in red, all, the, all that is being removed, which is outside of the building footprint. And then we are going to bring it down to grade level to allow access to anyone visiting the building. Next. This is the proposed site plans. You can see this, the where the building is, and you can see that there's a new pavilion out front and a bunch of landscaping that we're gonna be adding to the site. I'm sorry, Scott. I didn't really get that last part. So is that what was in red? Red is the area that we're we're going to be demolishing from the existing footprint. Right. But what what is the... those are the stairs and various the stairs and various other aspects of the building, the bridge, all that's going to be coming down. So if you go oh, to you say... go ahead. Yeah, if you can you go back to that slide maybe for a second while you talk yeah, about it. So the area in red 
are the existing stairs that lead up to the building. So if you looked at that first picture of the building, you see all those stairs and you see the little building out front, that little yeah. one story, so you can scroll in that right there. So that area that all that is being demolished because right now this is your access to the building. And as you can see, stairs are not ideal for the general public or for anyone to come in that is handicapped or anything else. So the biggest, one of the big drivers besides security and other things is making this building universally accessible. So gotcha. all that is going to be removed in order to allow us to build a grade level pavilion for security screening. Great. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Good. Go on to the next one. And again, this was the after. So this is just a view, a rendering of the building, looking at it from um, by, you know, going by the way it would be at maybe at the Brooklyn Bridge and zoomed in a little bit. You can go to the next one. I'm going to show now the next is going to be a bunch of slides showing the before and after from the various vantage points. So this is, you know, in one St. Andrews in St. Andrews Plaza, looking at the model building. Go next. And this is that same view of what it will look like when we're done with construction. Next one. This is a view now from looking basically if you're at the Dinkins building, looking at Malo. Yeah, next one. And this is what it will look like after. Scott, can you can you just uh, quickly comment that you're using the existing uh, structure, the slab and, and everything, you're just recladding it and putting new glazing on and renovating <laughs> the interiors. Uh, will this affect the any any bulk or height of this existing structure at all? No, the 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 the, the we're we're keeping the same number of floors, keeping the same number of everything. The the penthouse, the may r go up a little bit, but we're still evaluating that the mechanical area. But you will you won't really notice a difference. The parapets may be a little bit higher, but as far as square footage of the building, it's basically the same. But it won't be a meaningful difference if there is a slightly higher. No, as you can see, the one big thing we're doing is if you looked at the original building, the building steps in right at that right there. You see how there's a big void yeah. underneath the building that that we're, we're we're closing that in. So that's really what's the biggest change to the building is in closing that area. That's. You know, an overhang. When you that overhang though does it become now and it becomes interior space it does it does it does it becomes interior space it becomes double height because the floor floor to floor on some of these areas one floor is really we've there's not it's there's double height ceilings in a lot of areas so it really does not changing anything it's just enclosing it because we got to address those columns that are exposed like that thank you Go to the next one. Basically, it's the same. Look, this is like coming from by the Dinkins at coming up St. Andrews Plaza, just a, a night view. And this is considered the um, <coughs> visitor entrance. The staff entrance is on the back side of the building. So the employee, the visitors, where most visitors to this building that would come in would be coming for, by the train or walking up. This is the this this makes it a lot easier for for visitors to see the building. Scott, the other federal buildings, um, you know, whenever there's, you know, unrest or, you know, whatever it's perceived to be an extended security kind of, you know, I don't know, change, uh, a lot of these buildings are now wrapped in French barricades and it seems like the barricades will never come down. Um, what about this design will kind of prevent that? Because we have these beautiful federal buildings but they're all kind of wrapped in these temporary barricades um, and, you know, totally channeling everyone. And um, do, they, do, you, do you know if those buildings don't adhere to current security guidelines and these will not have to have that treatment if so there is unrest? The, the, those barricades are actually, those barricades are not, were not installed by us right now. Um, those barricades were installed by the NYPD. Um, because as we, in order to get, you walk right past Malo to get to NY one police plaza in the background there. 
um, the bridge to M one police plaza is right in front of our building. So well, the I mean, like the, the federal court building that's on Worth Street. Yeah, that's, you know, different because there's nothing we, we per, in this building, we wouldn't necessarily have barricades placed just because um, NYPD is more concerned and they, you know, they would typically put those barricades because all the barricades and everything that we put on they, they that they put in we're you know we're designing this with you know bollards planters etc to prevent you know for, and building this pavilion to give us uh the security that we're is required thanks scott scott um on the left side of the building it's not as open it looks like it's just a solid concrete gray siding is that the, on the left hand side, the side that yeah. is the core of the building. So that's where the elevators are. Um, so it's a, it's a side core building. The core is not in the center where you would typically have the core, everything, the elevators, everything in the center. This building is on the side. So that's why, um, you know, you have your mechanical spaces, uh, bathrooms, et cetera, on that side of the building. Okay. So we keep that in, you know, covered. So it's. Um, because there's nothing to put windows in. There's no actual office space there. Who are the typical visitors to the building? It could be um, law enforcement, like that are, you know, prosecutors or defense attorneys, press when they do press conferences. Um, you, know, you have a lot of defense attorneys, defendants that may come, maybe potentially witnesses to crimes would be in there. So there'd be a lot of different people that would be coming in that's open to the general public so you have to have a specific reason and be going to see someone yeah typically yeah you, you you know the general public it's not a front-facing agency like you know social security or irs which would be a little bit different you, you usually people that are coming here is they're, they're coming for a specific reason scott how often do you get like press gaggles out front there so, so let's wait until uh that finishes and then do not know. I don't. I, I you, you, you can ask the years. It's already, but they they do most of their press conferences are inside the building. Okay. Uh, we have also one question from Eric. You. Well, uh, Justine has had her hand up. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. And I think Eric did too. But um, I have to jump soon. So I I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, thanks Scott for the presentation. Um, I love that you said that the that whatever changes you're making are going to be to built to to carbon net zero, but you said you're doing it to the lead standard. That's not the highest um, standard we have available now. It's my mind is spacing on what is the highest standard, but leads isn't it? Um, lead lead is platinum. Reason? It's we're doing lead platinum, okay. which is the highest level of lead that is available. Lead platinum. So lead, lead. There's different. Variables of lead is lead certified, then there's lead silver, lead gold, we're and then the, platinum. okay, we're going to lead platinum. So lead we're platinum. required to do lead as part of the government, you at the federal requirements. Oh, interesting. So you're doing the highest level, and that, that okay, that explains it. I think there are higher levels than that, but I don't know what they are. Then I have um, questions, which maybe I just spaced out when you were saying it. How long is this going to take, and when are you going to start? We haven't gotten to that, but just starting um, the the we're we're targeting once we have the U.S. Attorney is expected to move out this October from the building. So and we will probably take until December to get the building completely emptied. So we we're looking to start in um, May of 2024. Okay, and, and how long do you think it'll take? Three years. Okay, we're on. Well, all right, Justin, one more, because I don't think Scott um, has finished his presentation yet. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So that, that, and, and then uh, the other question is um, about the overhang, overhang. Was that public space before or no? It was parking. Yeah. It was parking for the U.S. Attorney. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Pat. I'm going to let Eric ask because he's been waiting. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, with the overhang, it, is there any plan to collect water the rainwater and reuse it. Yes. And we are we are collecting all rainwater off the building. We have um, I don't know the size of the tank, but we have a huge cistern sitting in the cellar, um, which will be reused for landscaping and for flushing toilets. We don't have uh, a cooling tower because we're going to go all air source heat pump to the building. 
So we are going to not be, if we had a cooling tower, we would be using all the water. But in this case, we don't really have a need um, to reuse all the water. So we'll be slowly put back in. But the main thing is it will be any water that can be reused will be reused in the site. Okay, because I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at the overhang and I, and I see that that's quite a large surface area and especially over the, as it reaches over the edge, that, that, that could be quite a large volume of water during yes. the range. So we, we, we are, we are retaining um, all the water that is, I think it's like 90% of the rainwater that comes down in a rain event. Oh, excellent. Um, and yeah, then, so we have a bigger tank than is required by DEP. Wow. Uh, then the second question is, Will there be provision um, for bicycle parking or uh, docking for people that choose to use it? There are, um, this doesn't show, there's to the left of that sign, the Silvio Milo sign, we had planned for some bike racks. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's required, uh, bike racks are required per lead as well. So we, we need that in order to get uh, certification. Thank you. Yeah. Scott, which one one thing about the bike racks? Can you please uh, use bike racks that are in the, the upside down U yep. design and not the not the wavy line because the wavy line ones are unusable, whereas the ones that are used um, actually allow multiple bikes to chain up. So we have to DOT part of the PDC discussion we had. They gave us their standard bike rack that has to be used it's like a circle that's perfect perfect yes it's like a, that, some that kind of circle of some sort yeah yeah so we're, we we are we we agreed to use their standard for bike rack that was their com that was a, a conversation they had as well we can go to the next one and it's just this is the same view but this is looking at the um employee entrance so you can see it through the glass there's a art sculpture in there that's currently at model that no one actually sees because of where it's located we're going to move it out front so that the the um community anyone walking by will be lit up at night can actually see the the art that is actually in the building that was um done uh i forgot the last name is ferrer um that designed this uh the sculpture Got his first name, but he he um he's very happy that the sculpture will now be prominent and the anyone that anyone walking by can see it. Good. Next slide. Um, this is our last slide, but uh, this is kind of our logistics plan. As you can see, um, we're going to be doing most of our let's call uh, our laydown area and logistics and basically a site access is going to be on Park Row. So we'll be having our crane there and a hoist on the Park Row side. We're going to be closing off parts of St. Andrews Plaza, but, you know, just for safety reasons, as we're building everything, we are going to be maintaining um, pedestrian access along St. Uh, Cardinal Hayes, excuse me, um, to get to St. Andrews Plaza. Because I know the community, their major pass through to get through to like Chinatown and various other areas um, down to Park Row is through Cardinal Hayes. So we are going to be maintaining that access for pedestrians and we will have overhead coverage and, you know, uh, sidewalk bridging, et cetera, to keep the public safe during our construction. I think that is my last slide. Uh, we can now open it up again for questions. Let's see some hands. Do I see anyone? Am I missing someone? Anyone from the public? I don't see any hands from the public. I'm sorry, listen, what? Not seeing any hands from the public, Pat. Uh, Jill has her hand, is the only hand I see. Okay, yeah, Jill. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, I'm not a great, you know, arch I have no great architectural knowledge and I, I my opinion, the current building isn't exactly beautiful, but my question is, this design doesn't really strike me as fitting in with the church and sort of the quaint area and the Cass Gilbert courthouses. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any other thoughts on the design, but it feels a little kind of just plain modern not exactly, you know, a um, 
picturesque choice. Is there a reason why the building is being reclad? One, it's the facade is very inefficient, the existing brown. And our goal is to lighten the facade up. Um, right now, this, you know, the way we look at it is this, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office is more along this right now it's kind of designed to mimic uh, one police plaza and the prison next door which is the same it was built at the same time as malo was a sister project currently our building supplies chilled water and steam to the prison um, although it's closed it still does um, but we wanted to lighten it up to kind of make it more fit in with the Dinkins building, as well as the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse, which is a much lighter, lighter facade, which is why the, you see the, the lighting, the lighter type of texture and material that is shown on the on the facade. Um, so, like th these currently are CMU blocks that are like two feet thick. They have to come that need that need to come out, and it's they're very heavy. Um, it's it's not great lighting. It's there's a lot of reasons why the existing facade needs to go away. May I ask a follow up? Sure. Okay. Um, how will this impact the church? And as I said, it doesn't strike me as is really fitting in with that particular you know, area in the church and, and, and the courthouses. How will this impact the church? And also, there's a lot of concern I've heard from many people with glass buildings and birds flying into them. So we, we are required to have bird safe glass. Um, we, we have requirements to, to prevent birds from flying in. You know, this, this is still a very short building compared to all the other buildings in the area where, you know, 10 stories, whereas Thurgood Marshall is much higher. And so is, you know, the Dinkins, all the buildings are much higher than ours. Um, but, you know, we do have you know, the, the idea is bird safe gla glazing and various other aspects for because of that. And the impact on the church? There shouldn't be any impact on the church except for during construction. Um, you know, we're, we're they're, they're maintaining their access. We're not impacting their access to the church. We're not impacting any of the utilities or anything of that nature. Um, so we, we've been, they've, you know, they've been in our meetings with when we have our community meetings and, you know, they haven't voiced any concerns at this time. Great. But we, we will continue to have meetings with our direct neighbors that will be impacted for the three years of construction. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. And the other, did you, did you tell us when um, you're starting? Yeah, it was supposed to start in May of 24. Uh, you have one hand in the uh, from the public. One hand from the public. Yeah, Jonathan Hollander. Hi, Jonathan. Go ahead, Jonathan. Jonathan, you're muted. You can speak. Yep, hear you. Thank you. I happen to have walked around to Police Plaza about a week ago. Plaza is waking up, Jonathan. Can't hear you. Condition. There's a brim. Hear me? Jonathan, we can't hear you. You're breaking up. Jonathan, I think I can I can relay your question. Um, it's about the, the, the red sculpture. sculpture. The red sculpture. Sculpture is in terrible condition, and the paving. Of the plaza is also de degraded. Okay, Jonathan, we didn't hear all of it. Uh, Lucian, can you? Did you hear it? Yeah, um, he's, he's he's inquiring about the the red art that's on the plaza um, closer to one police plaza. If this project will have any uh, any responsibility to uh, upgrade or re uh, restore that, and then. Also, the, he's remarked that the the plaza itself um, is in very poor shape, um, and to what degree this this project may improve that condition. So, the paving is full of broken areas. Yeah. So the sculpture is not our property. It's New York, owned by New York City. 
they would be, you know, we wouldn't be touching it. We're staying away from that sculpture. Um, so that's, that's a New York City sculpture of some sort. Um, the plaza itself, we will be repairing the plaza in the proximity of the model building, but the rest of the plaza is not being touched by us. So that's, as that is New York City property as well. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? And then I see Eric again. Anyone else from the public though? No, Eric? Uh, yeah, just uh, mind a question. Why does it say MTA building work on, on, the, on, on this? Um... The, and that, that was an old MTA substation adjacent oh. to our building. That little, if you look to the right of the Malo building on Park Row, that which is over, you know, number 15, I think that, uh, sorry. Yeah, MTA substation. That was an old MTA substation, which was the ownership of that MTA substation is now owned by the Bureau of Prisons. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Um, so, so, we have a hand up with Jetta. Oh, Jetta, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jetta. Jetta, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, just can you just say what what the address is again of this? One, one St. Andrews Plaza. Okay. And have you filed already with the DOB? We don't file with the DOB. It's a federal facility. Oh, that's oh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Scott, um, you're not starting until May, 2024. I'm that's sure the hope. I'm sorry. That's the goal. Right now, you know, we're waiting for our final funding from Congress and Senate. Um, but the right. goal, but we're, you know, our target is May of 2024 to start. So I'm sure we're going to have some other questions. Would you, can you come back and visit us again in a few months and let us know any updates? Sure. And I know Tom is going to be doing the, um, the public documents. And we're going to set up a public hearing. I, I think it's a public meeting. I don't know the exact terminology, Tom. You can, you can yeah, explain uh, it. We, we are planning to have a uh, public meeting uh, in conjunction with the release of our environmental assessment for the project for public review and comment. And when we schedule that, I'll certainly notify a uh, community board and we'll have a public notice on that. And we'll also have outreach to some of the local community uh, in the nearby apartment buildings as well. Great. Yeah, because that's what we'd like to talk about. Um, how, what route you're going to take, use to take away materials. You know, do we need to be concerned about noise? Um, yeah, and I think uh, the construction activities will be uh, occurring uh, during the daytime hours. And as part of our requirements is we will be essentially adhering to the New York City uh, noise code for this. We have to. All right. And then we always ask uh, when, a, when a project starts that there be someone that can be contacted doing real time. So in case mm -hmm. if someone in the public notices a problem or has a noise issue or safety issue, yeah. they can contact someone. Yeah, so and I, I think that that will definitely happen. You know, certainly for the neighbors there and for anybody else, there'll be signs up there, uh, most likely on who you can contact to call if there's any issues or problems or they have questions. They also, you'll need to, you said you're going to keep the walkway open. So I guess you're going to also need to have someone to do some outreach to let the public know right. and, and also what kind of image they'll be to let people know the walkway is open. Right. And that's one of the things we want to make, at least let know some of the community members, especially uh, in uh, Chatham Towers, uh, north and uh, to uh, and on the other side of Park Row, about what's happening. Fantastic. All right, so we will see you when you are ready to be seen. <laughs> um, hey, what, what, one thing, uh, Eric, um, if you, I'm just looking at the the floor plan. I'm looking at the turnaround area and then the the green construction fencing. Um, as this is a, a major corridor for people going to and from the, the Brooklyn Bridge City Hall uh, subway station, as well as people from the area walking to Chinatown for lunch. 
I would recommend um, making sure that there's um, convex mirrors uh, on the um, northernmost corner of the, the fence because there's just going to be people walking in and out, um, uh, maybe even along the, uh, uh, the substation wall or the, I'm sorry, the federal prison wall and that may pop out and, so and um, it may be good for any vehicle that's going down to be able to see them s somehow using mirrors. Um, because it's a blind spot, given that pedestrian, um, the pedestrian away. volumes may be um, unsafe. We can talk about that with our, our contractor, which we've already hired a contractor for this work, which is Turner Construction. Um, and we can talk about that for their part of their safety plan. All right. Thank you both, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will see you in a few months. Okay, no, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening and taking taking your time to hear about our uh, our project. This is the kind of stuff we're interested in. We have we'll probably have more questions. Yeah, no, I we understand it completely. And the good thing about it is that we're making the building better. It's going to be more efficient. It's going to be all electric, no more steam, no more gas, and it'll be a more uh, efficient building, low in body carbon. We're using the concrete and steel that's already there, so we think it's a good thing. Great. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a good night. Good night. So now next we are going to, is it San, uh, Captain Sansef from New York uh, Police Department uh, Transit District 2? That's correct, uh, Sansef. And uh, I have my uh, Naval Coordination Team here with me as well. Um, so uh, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. For coming and thanks for waiting through those two. Topic. So, what are we talking about? I guess what's going on in our community? What's going on in the train station? Um, all right. Well, you know what? Uh, just to start off with the numbers, and then you know we'll take some questions from there. Um, you know, on on the year, um, you know, in in the confines of the first precinct, which is uh, you know the, the bulk of your your uh, district there. Um, we're down 32% in crime on the on the year, um, down in every category. Our robberies, our assaults, our grand larcenies, um, all down on the year. So we're down 27% uh, in robbery, 50% in assault, and 11% in uh, in the grand larcenies. As far as the 28-day period, which is how we capture it, we we don't go month to month. We go in a rolling uh, four-week period. Um, Four crimes, four index crimes against 12 last year. So we're down 66%, um, you know, over, over that period. So, um, you know, we're really doing well um, with a crime reduction in, in, in the year and in the past month, um, you know, in the downtown area. So, um, yeah, any, any specifics, uh, any areas you'd like us to go into uh, specifically? I guess before actually start asking some questions would you do you have any update about the collapse of the building and how it might have affected the uh transit yeah um no no effect at all i mean um you know all the lines are running all four subway lines are running through there um we had a closure yesterday at the uh the two and the three um entrance at the corner of um of william and um william and fulton but that that's now been opened and, uh, you know, access and everything is uh, business as usual. Okay, so that's good. Uh, I'm going to open it up. I think Lucian has a question. Hi, Captain. Thanks for attending. Really appreciate it. Uh, I think just for the benefit of the committee and the public, um, can you generally give us an idea of which uh, major stations are that you are under your jurisdiction within the general confines of CB1? You know, for example, like, um, I know uh, Chambers, uh, uh, Church and Chambers, um, is Fulton Street in Transit District 2? Yes, it is, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, that's, that's um, you know, our busiest hub in, in downtown, um, you know, absolutely. I mean, you have four lines that run through there, and then you have, um, you know, access to the path, access to the R and W line, access to the E line, you know, walking um towards the Oculus and World Trade Center. So, you know, that's our busiest hub. Um, 
you know, we put a lot of resources, in, you know, into the Fulton Center, um, you know, around the clock, 24 hours a day. Uh, we always have coverage there, um, you know, because it's it's a top priority uh, to us, that station. Yeah, I, I know that Fulton, the above ground, Fulton Street is one of the uh, challenging areas um, uh, in our district. Um, what, I know that the overall, uh, the numbers are looking really good uh, for transition too, but how, focusing on Fulton Transit Center, um, how would you describe the state of, of, of things in terms of, is that center, the, the index crimes there getting better overall as well? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, you, normally it's one of our top three stations in the, in the confines of uh, District 2. Um, you know, I mean, this year, um, you know, we're, we're down, we have uh, eight crimes there for the year. You know, last year we we had like uh, close to thirty for the year. So, um, you know, I think um, think we're doing well. And we had a robbery and a um, and an assault there last week that was, uh, you know, unfortunate uh, circumstances. But uh, you know, overall, I think we're headed in the right direction. We have a, a solid deployment there. Um, you know, we're working closely with uh, Westfield. Um, you know, to to make uh, make our plan even better. We'll work closely with them, the first precinct, because they have a, uh, you know, integral part in it as well. Um, the allied guards, you know, we're all working together, uh, you know, to lock that place down, uh, you know, even even better than it is. Congratulations on that, Captain. Thank you. Um, are we having any more issues with homeless people in any of the stations? Um, you know, I mean, ba based upon the optics, um, you know, it's gotten a lot better. I mean, we run, um, you know, what, what we call an end of line detail, which is, uh, you know, our, our end stations. Uh, we run that at uh, World Trade Center on the E. We, we have it at South Ferry um, on the 1 and uh, Broad Street on the J. We, we have it there at times as well. And what that does, um, you know, we stop the trains. It gives the MTA an opportunity to thoroughly uh, deep clean the trains. Um, we offer services. We have DHS. We have VRC out there with us. Um, you know, we have uh, EMS on standby if we need them. So, you know, I, I think that's been, uh, you know, instrumental, um, you know, in offering services to the uh, to the homeless population. Um, in addition, we work with the uh, the Port Authority Police. Uh, a few times a month, usually twice a month, we work with them and another organization called uh, Breaking Ground and Urban Pathways. I'm sorry, Urban Pathways to offer them uh, services as well. That uh, if we remove them from the World Trade Center uh, area, so um, I think we we have a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of good resources in place, um, you know, and we're offering them uh, you know services if if they uh, if they would like to do so. Yeah. We have, um, in addition, we have on top of the um, joint operations with um, the Port Authority Police, we're also working with Barry Resident uh, Corporation. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Barry Resident Committee. Um, you know, several times a month as well to you know walk the stations and offer the services uh, to the individuals. And just if, if the individuals don't want to avail themselves of your the services being offered. What what happens? What's the engagement then? Yeah, I mean, we we can't we can't compel them to accept services. We then do remove them, um, you know, from the property. Um, you know, that they're not allowed to uh, you know sleep overnight in the uh, you know the Fulton Center, the World Trade Center, or any of our stations. So you know, we we then offer them you know medical services if if they're uh, you know, have any medical conditions? We offer them a ride. Obviously, you know, hospital EMS. Those services, um, you know, or a ride to a shelter if they choose. But if if not, then, you know, they, they're free. They're free to leave at the present time. But we can't we can't compel them, uh, barring you know them being an emo emotionally disturbed, which is, um, you know, a danger of harm to themselves or somebody else. So we make that determination. If they're an EDP, you know, that then they go, um, you know, forcefully. But if they're not, they're free. They're still free to leave. And I'm curious. So, how are the officers assigned to ride the train? How are they assigned to ride the trains? Well, we they're have uh, we we have uh, you know train patrols 
extended tours every night. Um, you know, we assign officers to stay extra hours beyond their tour to provide, uh, you know, train patrols. Um, all three tours, you know, we, we extend them a few hours into the midnight hours. The midnight um, overnight teams, they work a little later into the morning and our day tours work, you know, later into the afternoon. And, uh, you know, we have them, um, you know, pretty much on every line. Uh, we focus primarily on our heavier lines, which are, you know, the one, two and three and the AC and E, but we do have coverage on uh, every line. Um, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, no, no lines are left out of that, um, you know, but it's been a plan that's been in effect for, uh, you know, close to 2 years now. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it's been effective because, um, you know, our numbers are down. So, the officers that ride on the trains, do they go from car to car or do they just, are they just located in 1 car? Yes. How many no, that that's, um. That's that's how we do it. You know, they uh, they're assigned to ride uh, the train, let's say, from South Ferry to Canal Street for argument's sake. You know, the train pulls into one station and uh, you know, so let's say they pull into Rector Street. They're supposed to change cars, ride that to, let's say, Cortland, change cars again. So, you know, you're, you're checking every car along the, uh, you know, along the route. And, and when you're switching cars, obviously, if there's any conditions on the platform, we address those as well. Um, so, you know, you're getting, you know, platform coverage and train patrol coverage, uh, you know, at the same time with these train patrols. Right. I'm going to open it up to questions now. I see Eric's hand is up. Eric? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I see fare evasion almost every day uh, at Bowling Green. And then, yeah, mostly at Bowling Green. Um, sometimes at, at, at Chamber Street. Um, yeah, and it's done without any embarrassment or hesitation almost. And um, I'm I'm just I'm I am concerned that this leads to other crimes. Um, when when your officers do do apprehend somebody uh, avoiding the fare, do they check a person? I I know that they issue a summons a desk. A, a, a you know desk ticket for a fu future appearance, but do they check if that if that person has any outstanding warrants? Yeah, no, we we certainly do that. Um, that's all done via our uh, department smartphones that have access to you know all the uh, you know the databases to run the name. So that's definitely a required step, and um, you know it, it's being done. And if they do have a warrant, then obviously they're not issued uh, you know that summons. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's definitely being done. Um, and, and, you know, we have uh, checks and balances in place by my, uh, you know, integrity control officer to make sure that those checks are being done as, as required. And then if, if they are um, apprehend, I, I don't know, caught uh, evading the fare, going through the turnstile, the emergency exit, are, are they told to leave the system or they just let them go in? I mean, it's, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a, as a way of, of making it inconvenient. Like, it's not just you're going to get a, 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 a desk appearance ticket. You have to leave the system, and then, of course, you can come back in. But to create, I won't say uncomfortable, but just to say that there is, there is more of an inconvenience if you do get caught evading the fare. Well, right. I, I mean, if you, if you receive a summons um, and you still want to ride the train, then you have to you know, pay you 275 and then you can ride the train. Um, now, what we have is, you know, a summons, um, I'm sorry, an, an ejection report. So if you don't receive a summons and we just eject you from the system, um, then if you do come back, you will be arrested for trespass. That's, that's what a transit ejection entails. Um, so, you know, but if you get a summons and you want to still ride the train, you, you can pay. And then ride the train like anybody else if if you do have the two seventy five um to pay. What is an ejection pardon? I, I don't know what that is. Why why would it be an ejection? You know, an officer has um discretion when they observe a violation. Okay, they, they can eject the person from the system and fill out what we call an ejection report. 
um, or they can issue them the summons. That th that's the option they have with the violation. If there's a crime, which is a misdemeanor or a felony, then they have to make an arrest. There's no discretion. So you know, minor low level offenses, um, such as you know being outstretched, taking up two seats, um, you know, fare evasion, spitting, what have you. Those are the situations where they have discretion. They can either do an ejection or they can write the summons. Um, so that's that's basically how it works on the low level uh, offenses. And, uh, you know, we use discretion where warranted and, uh, you know, if the summons is warranted, then then we issue one. Okay. Uh, my last question relating to this is um, what happens if, a, if, if somebody apprehended evading the fare doesn't have ID? Um, and then they're in arrest. Um, and, you know, if we can't verify your ID, and that goes for any sum, it's not just fair evasion, um, you know, that then you have to be removed to the station house, uh, you know, for an arrest. Okay, thank you. Sure. Pat, you're muted. Mitch and then Desi. Okay, uh, just uh, three, three comments. Uh, First, uh, officer, you had mentioned about the uh, last stop patrol at, and you had mentioned the J train besides the other ones. And if you could also include, unless you just forgot to mention the number 6 train at that, uh, you know, the same, uh, you know, Brooklyn bridge stop, uh, uh, is, you know, the other side of the J train, uh, that's also a last stop. Yeah. So, you know what? Uh, I, I, I. Just didn't think of that 1, just cause it's, uh. Technically, it's not in the confines of the first precinct. Um, I, I was just thinking in, in, in it's in the same, the, the, the J and the six. Technically, it's it technically it's in the confines of the fifth. So I, I it kind of just really because it's, it's in the same station though. Yeah, no, I, I know that's just a, a technicality there. But no uh, problem. That that cool. Number two, um, you know, I'm sure everybody tries, but for somebody that's on the trains all the time, cops are not usually going from car to car. Uh, it, it's just not happening. Then you know, I, I mean. I, I see them in the, you know, if they're in the, if they're there in the car, they, they'll most of the time they'll be in the same car for most of the ride. So, the, you know, but uh, I don't want anybody to lose their job over it, but, you know, it's, it's not really happening like it's supposed to be on paper. And then the third thing, that's not, also not the end of the world, but I'm seeing an incre a real big increase in people. I'm not talking about service dogs, but people just bringing their pets like they're going to the park. And I'm also not talking about like, you know, a little, like hush puppies in, in somebody's purse, but people just walking on with their medium or big size dogs. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it'll be changed, fixed when somebody gets bitten or, or the, an incident happens. So, uh, but I see zero enforcement about that. I mean, you know, we really stepped up our enforcement, um, you know, in recent months, there's obviously there's room for improvement, um, you know, and, and that'll okay. be, you know, that'll be noted. Um, you know, I mean, we've, we've significantly increased the uh, enforcement in the system overall in, in district 2, um, you know, in the last, I'd say 2 to 3 months, it's, it's really gone up. Yeah, of course there's room for improvement. Um, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, my, my supervisors, my supervisors are out there to, you know, correct, you know, the, uh, deficiencies by the cops. Is everyone a hundred percent, uh, perfect? Well, of course, of course not, but you know, what we're, we're, uh. You know, we're moving in the no, right and you're direction. Trying. And, but uh, if you could, no, that'll, you that'll could be least, noted, of course. Yeah. Right. Just, but as far as like, you know, I don't want anybody going to jail because they're, you know, like they're walking in with their like, uh, you know, 50 pound dog, like, uh, you know, and, and uh, some people might not want to sit next to them, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's happening so much more that you don't see anybody really being afraid to, to, to take their, 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 their pet on a leash uh, uh, in the subway. Yeah. Well, you know what we've done? Um, you know, in the past few months, uh, you know, since we got a new, uh, new chief of transit, a new regime here, we've really focused ourselves on, uh, turnstile posts. And I, I think what that does is, you know, stop some of the infractions. Okay. Uh, at the turnstile to, to try to, you know, keep some of these things out of the system. Um, you know, it's been a new deployment strategy, um, in the past few months. And, uh, you know, I, I think going forward, it'll, it'll be very effective. You know, obviously we're not at every station at the turnstile. Of course. We're picking. You know the, the most bang for our buck, but uh, you know we'll definitely keep uh, keep an eye out for that. Definitely. Yeah. The the, the way, uh, on the, instead of being uh, like well, one other suggestion, and then I'll be finished. Instead of sometimes being at the main entrance to a station, like say, you know, on Chambers Street, there's three or four different entrances. To maybe have them deployed at the entrances where there isn't the token booth attendant, 
because you know that seems to you know to have some eyes in some of those other or like more desolate or like areas uh, might be you know more of a comforting to uh, to writers. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. Th thanks for the suggestion. Uh, you know, but constantly reevaluating the deployment. Um, you know, but we'll definitely you know keep that um, you know in, in mind. Thank you. Okay, like, Pat. Pat. Thanks, Smith. What? So, what's the law about your pet? If they can't get in, if they can't be in the carrier, what are you supposed to do with them? Yeah, I mean, you know, dogs are not allowed on the subway system unless they serve service animals. Um, you know, the the issue is, um, you know, we're not allowed to ask them. Um, that that's a law. <laughs> and you know, another another thing, and we have four hundred and seventy two stations, um, in the system. Some of them have a dozen entrances. So, you know, it, it's a challenge, absolutely. You know, but it's something that we can, you know, definitely work on. Well, so somebody walking in with a pit bull and they can, they just say he's a service dog and your, your hands are tied. So something has to change like above, above you, you know, like like above, yeah. you know? So I'm not sure if people really know that they're not allowed to bring their dogs on the subway. Of course they do. Information. Every ninety ninety percent of the people know Pat. It, it's that's not so true. Speaking from experience. Oh, you're on the other ten percent. Like you could. Oh, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's an issue for the MTA. They they can you know have some better signage up. Um, yeah, because. I I don't think, and especially a lot of the young people who have moved to New York, I don't think that they're aware. I mean, we have issues with bikes where they're not aware they shouldn't ride on the sidewalk. I don't think a lot of young, younger people know that they're not allowed to bring their dogs on the subway. Anyway, we can The MTA did an advertisement about dogs in bags. Yeah, dogs in bags, I thought were allowed. Yeah, oh, yeah I'm not talking about that. Bags. We're talking about dogs walking coming on a leash like you're going to Central Park, you know, meeting to big size dogs. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right, let's talk on the topic of dogs. Um, it was, uh, it was um, Desi and then uh, Jill and then Mimi. Desi? Hi there, good evening. good evening. I actually didn't know that pets were not allowed on the subway, by the way. I thought as, as long as they were small enough to fit in a bag or as long as they were a service animal, but that's... Well, service it's... animals are allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't aware that no other dog was allowed. Okay. But um, my my comment is really a concern about, um, you know, the idea of fair beaters turning into larger criminals. I I'm I'm just very concerned about that characterization, and I think that I'm certainly not encouraging anybody to beat a fair, but I would be, um, I would have a real issue with someone being tarred and feathered for beating a fare for $2.75 and then not having identification if for some reason they're a student or someone who just doesn't have it. I think that there are bigger fish to fry and I would much rather see resources and um, active policing going around um, addressing the mental health of people who are in the subway who really need another place to be and some other place to get help and get care and get sleep. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. I do find oftentimes that fair beaters are young people and they're people who just don't have the money to get on the subway. I don't think that there should be an implication that if they're beating the fair, that they're also going to be later on pushing someone into the subway tracks. I'm, I, I'm a believer in quality of life and I believe that everyone should should pay their fare to get on the train, but I don't think that we should be focusing on creating a larger um, framework of criminalization around people who who beat the fare. I just wanted to throw that out there. Right. Well, um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, the officer has discretion um, at any time. So, you know, we, we do cut people breaks when they're appropriate. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm out there myself. I watch, you know, a lot of body cam footage and we, we give people a break when one is warranted. So, um, you know, and, and we also do, uh, as, as I mentioned, offer services to the homeless. Um, 
you know, every night we have these uh, these services uh, offered. So, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, striking a balance here between office and services and enforcement. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do both that. at the same time. Great. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think everybody has a right to elevate their concerns. My concern is, I guess, a counter to my colleague's concern about, you know, beating the fair. I, I think that um, we have a lot that needs to, is left to be desired in terms of the quality of life on the subway. And I think that, you know, focusing on the, um, the minimizing of where potential um, larger crimes come from rather than uh, $2.75 not being paid. Thank you for uh, coming and chatting with us. I just want to make everyone aware that we have a bigger topic coming up next. The DDC is here, so we need to move. But go ahead, uh, Joe, and then Mimi, and I think that's going to, unless there's some really urgent question from the public. Go ahead. Uh, I'll make it as quick as I can. Uh, thank you, Captain. Uh, to build on, on what Desi just said, um, the fact that a person who uh, does not have ID on them would be arrested, to me, it just seems contrary to the fact that you don't have to carry papers in this country, you know, and saying people have to have ID on them, in effect, having to carry their papers or they will be arrested when there are other options, such as evicting them uh, or a warning or what have you, uh, is just absolutely frightening to me. Um, Secondly, everyone I know, and I believe we've all seen ads and pictures, believes that regardless of the size of your dog, if the dog's in a bag, then they can be on the subway. So uh, if you could clarify that any dog, even a non-service animal, if it's in a bag, it can be on the subway. That is my understanding, and I believe that is actually the understanding of 99% of the people. Right. Well, I think the... The, the issue we're, we're, we're talking about here is two different things. Um, the question was about like pit bulls and, and, and an aggressive animal. On leashes, on leashes, not in the bag. Okay. Right, right. I, I, think, I think we're talking about two different things. Um, you know, I think that was the concern more was, was uh, you know, vicious uh, animals. But, you know, as far as the ID issue goes, I mean, you know, those are, you know, agency, um, you know, policy um, that we're following. And, um, I mean, there's no other way for us to verify somebody's identification and issue them a summons if they don't have, uh, you know, some form of government issued ID. I, I mean, there's, there's just no other way for me to do it. Um, if we're going to do enforcement of fair evasion, which again is an agency, um, you know, policy, that's really the only way to do it. Uh, we have identification procedures. If you, if you pass those procedures, you get a summons. If not, a summons is issued in lieu of arrest in all cases. So you you then get processed for an arrest. Um, you know, but I would say the overwhelming majority of times uh the person does produce an ID, we're satisfied with it, they get their summons and and they move on. And and the the transit adjudication bureau summonses are uh you know they're civil in nature. They're just you know that you you but, but, but an arrest is not civil in, in nature. Right, it, it escalates to an arrest if, if you're not properly ID'd, um, you know, and, and again, those are those are policy decisions. We, we're not free. If you just have no ID, we're not we're not free to then, uh, you know, let you leave because we have to verify your ID if we're stopping you again. You know, that's that's, you know, agency policy. Yes. And is there a a way to then, yeah, is there a way to then assure that people can get identification through the police department? I don't have to say that. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a separate topic. We will take this up as a separate topic, but we need to move on. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you guys, but we need to move on. So, Jill, is that? Yes, okay. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, yeah, the ID thing is very disturbing. Uh, but I shared a cute video about the MTA and a dog in a bag uh, with Lucian, who I would love to share with everybody. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Any urgent to anyone in the public, Lucian? Yes. There's a Jay Chin in the public. I'm unmuting now. Jay okay. Chin, you're able to unmute and speak. Jay Chin, if you're on the phone, I think 
star six unmute you or star three, try one of those. That'll unmute you. All right. Going once, going twice. All right, Pat, so we can move on now. Okay. Moving on, I am going to thank the captain for spending this time with us this evening and thank answering you, our questions. If you have any other questions, you can give them to Lucian and he will forward them to the captain. In the meantime, thank you so much. Please stay safe out there and uh, we will, if we have questions, we'll send them along. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Same to Bye. You. Thank you. All right, so we're moving on to our regular GDC uh, report. And I'm sorry uh, to everyone at GDC that we kept you so long, but let's roll. So who's up? Okay, um, just real quick. There's a lot of people here for all of our reconstruction projects, GDC, dismantling. If I haven't moved you over as panelist and you should be a panelist, I'm sorry. Raise your hand, and I will move you over uh, forthwith. Forthwith. So, uh, with that, Pat, back to you. Okay, now who's starting? Good evening. Pat is uh, presenting. I believe he has a presentation to share. Hi, Marilyn. Hey, Pat. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Uh, one piece of housekeeping, Pat, if I may, um, and I'm still moving people over. Uh, I'm going to be putting a link in the chat. I would like everyone who has not signed our attendance sheet, please to do so. Uh, board members, this is how we know you're here. Uh, attendance is uh, something that we need to focus on this month, an executive, uh, uh, and uh, everyone's responsible for marking themselves present. So thank you with that. Pat, back to you. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, so who are we starting with? Good evening, Pat. This is Besher from Manhattan Construction. Uh, we will how go. Are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. So today we'll go through our active projects and our new upcoming projects in Community Board One. Okay. So for the first meeting, we have reconstruction of combined sewer in West Broadway. I believe we have either Gerald, Madeline, or Amy with us today to present. Uh, Lucian, can you move Maddie to the panelists so she can present? Sure. Maddie is Madeline Skoblik? Yes. Yes. Everyone, please raise your hand if you need to be moved over. I'm sorry, there's just so many people. Maddie, my apologies. That's okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Madeline Spielblick. I am the engineer in charge for this project, um, SCN 002178, the reconstruction of combined sewers in West Broadway. So our projected completion date is still June 29th of next year. Uh, percent of work completed is about a quarter, 25%. Um, so right now, we don't have an active crew on the project. Um, it's been like this since the beginning of the year. This is just some pictures of our MPT setup um, at our storage area on the north block. So this is on uh, West Broadway between Worth Street and Leonard Street. Um, so that one here we have... Um, the scaffolding in front of 60 Hudson Street has been removed, which is great. So that took a little longer than he, we wanted it to, but um, now that that will not be delaying us any further. Um, but yeah, so as of now, the reason for the delay is just that we've been working with the MTA to get an approved um, sheeting plan for the larger water main that we're installing. And we did get that and we had to wait for a uh, change order to be approved for the extra water main work that we're doing. That has also been approved. The um, contractor crew is currently on another project and they're just finishing that up and they're going to come back um, hopefully sometime in May. Uh, I think the worst case scenario would be uh, end of May is what they said. So here is a 
show of the remaining work that we have on the project. So this is just showing um, from the original project plans, the uh, sewer that we're going to be installing on both ends of the block. Um, go to the next slide. And this is what we have done and what we have remaining. So the light blue is the water main work that we have uh, completed on um, both blocks of the project on the east side. So that's the 12 inch water main replacement. When we come back, we're going to be starting, I believe, on the north block on the 20 inch water main upgrade to 24 inch, or maybe it's actually we're starting with the 12 inch to 20 inch and then the 20 to 24, but they're all within um, a small area of each other. So they'll be starting there and um, yeah, we'll go from there. So any questions? No. Okay. Oh uh, yes, I, I have a question. <laughs> oh, uh, who is who is this? Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Eric Yu. I just have a question. This is my first uh, meeting to quality of life. So mm -hmm. for these type of projects, um, do you inform ECS as con as well as Con Ed if you're doing this work? Just I I, I would just like to know what the process is when you're doing this type of street work. Um, yeah, we do inform them. This is actually a joint bid project. So we went in with ECS and Con Ed and they had, you know, their own plans for work that they needed to do. Um, sometimes things are a little bit closer than we thought they were going to be. And we have to add, um, you know, extra utility movement, um, work around there, but they are very involved with the project. Yes. Oh, yes. Cause I was, it was just a general question so that in case they have to do any work while you already have the street open, they mm -hmm. can. Besides just preparatory work, any yep. other work they could do at the same time. Exactly. Okay, that's you. the idea. Yep. Thank you. Always something has, uh, uh, this is Dushant. Uh, let me add addition to the whatever the meeting say. When the project is project is in design, we have a number of meetings during the design with the utilities, and uh, we accommodate them. And also some of the work and the coordination work is also being done since the design is started. And then we also follow up after the design during the construction. We have several meetings and uh, then we coordinate uh, with them to modify, upgrade their facilities as required. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Oh, um, so we finished with that, Madeline? Yep, we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for waiting also. No problem. So next, for, project. next project is the reconstruction of Greenwich, and I believe we have Philip with us today. Yeah, thank you, Basha. Good evening, everyone. I'm Philip Stafford, uh, CCL on the DDC's Greenwich Street project. Uh, I've been here several times now, so I think we know the idea of the job, but I'll just go over it quickly. This is a total roadway reconstruction project on Greenwich Street from Barclay all the way up to Chambers, and actively where we're working now is what well, we're considering the first phase of the job from Barclay to Murray Street, probably really about, you know, 90, 95% of the work we're gonna do on this project. So uh, what we've done so far, we've done all the drainage work on the east side of Greenwich from Barclay to Murray. And right now we're working on the drainage work on the west side of the street. And we've also began water main work. We've installed a 12 inch water main on Murray Street itself from Greenwich to West Street. And now we're beginning to uh, to work south from Murray to Barclay, and we're still sticking to right now. We're sticking to our anticipated completion date, which is November sixth, twenty four, and we've completed about twenty one percent of the work as of now. And you can see um, here's some more numbers: twenty one percent complete, and we've almost elapsed forty six percent of the job to. The percentage complete is always going to lag behind the time elapsed just because of how the payments work. Uh, but is, we've encountered much more utility interference than expected. So we're starting to kind of take a, a long look at our completion date. We haven't asked for any more time or anything like that yet. But depending on um, if we continue to encounter more and more interference from Con Ed, that's something we'll have to look into. And as of right now, um, Kind of working in 3 spots, if you walk by Greenwich street and Barclay street, you'll see. What we're calling a mass excavation, 
basically con eds in the area, ECS is in the area, everyone's getting their utility ducts out of the way or upgrading them so we can install our new water mains, water main mail in the area. And at Greenwich Street and Murray Street, we're doing the same thing. We're exposing everything, we're moving everything, and we'll bring a new 20 inch water main um, south down Greenwich Street. And at, at Greenwich and Park Place, we also have a, installing a shoe connection to us to the sewer, which is on the other, which is on the west side of the street. So the idea is, you know, all of this stuff's interconnected. So if we have a few areas we can work, when we do run into interference that holds us up a little bit, we can always hop to another spot. And uh, we've we've managed that quite well so far. The contractor has been very good at that. And then the next slide, Besher, we just have a couple pictures. So on the left side, that's Greenwich and Barclay, kind of looking northwest, I'd say. That's Beams, that's Fitterman Hall in the background. This is kind of a good example. I thought it was a good picture of what a joint bid job looks like. You can see uh, our contractor actively supporting a Con Ed crew there as they install a new gas main. And just a, it's really an incredible amount of utilities in the ground. And we have to raise everything up so we can go underneath. And on the on the right side as well, that's um, that's Murray and Greenwich, kind of the Whole Foods Bank of America building in the background. And similar thing, you see, uh, we have to move all those utility ducts. We have to do all the excavation by hand. That's that bag in the in the air, the machines moving. So it's just, there's a lot of utilities to get out of the way, but we're uh, actively working on it. If anyone has any questions, I'll answer what I can and I'll get back to you if I don't have an answer right now. I think you might be muted. Anupa. Pat, you're muted. I keep doing that, I'm sorry. In the left picture, so that big, huge pipe is the gas main. Yeah, the, the black pipe there. It's all the Con Ed, that's all Con Ed in orange. If you ever see the blue hat, it's usually Con Ed. So yeah. basically they, they cut out the existing gas main and moved it to a different lane so we can start to figure out where the water main is going to go. And uh, the other stuff you see is a mix of Con Ed's electrical lines and ECS, which is. The water main will run parallel to that big gas main, right? Yeah, the one that kind of kind of rusty looking conduits above is Con Ed. And it's a mix of Con Ed and uh, ECS there. And the same thing on the other side, the other picture, that's uh, what you can see. That's mostly ECS ducts. Wow. Amazing. Okay, great. Any, any questions? Eric, is your hand up again? Uh, yes. Uh, in the previous slide, you mentioned trolley materials. You know, what is that? Sure. Uh, the one more pr prior to the slide. Yeah, so uh, we ex in, the, in our drawings, it expects that the, there used to be a trolley track here. So we expect trolley track removal, which is, you know, common on a lot of projects in lower Manhattan. We haven't encountered anything. I, I don't know if we will. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just Eric, we, surprised they would still be there. Eric, I, I have some photos from uh, Vestry Street of some trolley truck removal. I'll forward to you. So I know as an MTA person, you must be interested. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you. And we we love it when we hear that stuff. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Any hands up? I can't see everybody's uh, hands. I, I have one one quick thing. Um, Philip, it uh, looks like. The the Bollard revocable consent item. Thank you, by the way, for connecting me again with the um, the the representative of 240 Greenwich uh, Mellon. Um, the transportation committee will have an item on its agenda in May uh, about the Bollards um, that are adjacent to this work, um, which will have to be coordinated with the the Greenwich Street reconstruction. So um, for all the members of this committee are certainly invited uh, to attend that as well, uh, because there will be a, a good deal of overlapping um, uh, information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, we've—I still talk to I'm supposed to talk to them. I talk to them every couple of weeks. There's not too much to talk about, but it looks like they're getting everything in a row, and it's, it'll be a quite a good level of coordination. But you know, we have a very good contractor and. They've been pretty easy to work with so far. And then just two things I forgot to mention. Um, next month is the American Heart Association 5K, which is right where we're working, but we've already talked to them and that should all be sorted out. Essentially, 
Uh, our job only impacts their staging area. I mean, they managed to do it last year. So just moving them around a little bit. I'm sure the DOT will have a walkthrough soon. And eventually, I don't have a date, near future, of course, I'll let everyone know, we're going to move the M9 bus stop that's on the north side of Greenwich, or north side of Murray between Greenwich and West Street. And I, I hear it's going to go um, to the north side of Murray Street between Greenwich and West Broadway. But I think we're probably, you know, a couple months out from that, at least. So probably by the time you come back month after next, you'll have that information. Yeah, or maybe the one after that, but uh, soon. Okay. We're always, always interested in bus stops just because for our seniors and, you know, for people who might have, um, you know, issues with mobility, they need to know that. So we need to get yeah, that absolutely. out there. Yeah, both Diane's have their hands up. So you guys fight it out. Diane Laps and Diane Stein. It's a mistake, uh, not me. Oh, Here I am. Howdy. Wait, who's got, is it Diane Lapson? Yes, Hi. this is Diane Lapson speaking from Lower Manhattan. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, two quick questions. Does any of this work involve sewage replacement, sewer replacements? Because we've been seeing a lot of presentations about uh, global warming and uh, resiliency, and I'm wondering if there's any change in policy about the the sewers and how they handle a larger amount of water that might be coming our way. Hey, Pat, this is this is Frank Elow from BBC. How are you? Frankie, how are you? Good, good. How's everything? We're hanging in there. Good. I, mean, I, can, I, I could answer that question. Um, we don't have sewer work involved in our contract. Okay. Uh, we just have water. Um, and there, there, is, there were no plans to uh, call for any sewer replacement on this job, unfortunately. So, so there is no, I, there is no, I don't know if there's any plans in the upcoming for anything like that. Um, only thing additional we added to scope was uh, one additional block of water main. We found a water main with some lead joints on it, and we're gonna replace that. Going north, so so that's the only additional scope we added so far. Okay, thanks. My other quick question is: Are any of these streets cobblestone streets? Hopefully, no, not. Oh, no, no. no. Really? none of these streets are cobblestone. No, okay. no cobblestone. I have no more no more Thanks, comments. Please. Thank you so much. Stay on the cobblestone. They all know we've had many cobblestone discussions. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have. <laughs> Thanks, Frankie. Okay, who's, uh, Philip, you done? Yeah, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, Philip. Thanks for waiting also. Who's next? Great. So our next project is going to be reconstruction of Front Street. I believe we have uh, Howie and Amelia. Hi, everyone. This is Howie Dang. I'm the resident engineer for reconstruction of Front Street. Uh, our scope of work. Our scope of work uh, is for six blocks uh, between Old Slip and John Street. Uh, our work includes curb and sidewalk, uh, 88 ramps, catch basins and chutes, uh, replacement of hydrants, uh, street replacement of street light and traffic signals, uh, including APS. And this is also a joint bid project involving Con Ed, ECS, and uh, Charter. Um, also, the replacement of street signs and also doing some tree removal and pruning. Uh, next slide, please, Pusher. So, our work completed to date. So far, we have uh, nearly 10,000 feet of con, uh, con ed conduits uh, that were built. Uh, we rebuilt six uh, con ed electric manholes. Uh, we thumbed some uh, abatement of steam mains and reinstallation of housing. Uh, also, we did one uh, re relocation of steam anchor, uh, which was in interference with our uh, catch basin. And also, so far, we've installed uh, five new catch basins and one new manhole and shoe connections. And also, we replaced, we uh, repaired. Uh, 
We placed uh, two new sewer manholes, the two sections of sewer pipe, uh, which is uh, damaged by Conrad steaming. And we've also lowered some existing 12 inch water main uh, to make room for our new roadway. And so far we've, um, this is actually a typo. So far we're done with the trolley removal. Uh, we found no actual steel tracks. We did find some um, wooden blocks that we believe were, uh, would be the railroad ties that supports the steel tracks. But um, other than that, we haven't found any actual hardware. Um, next slide, please, Basher. No good rivets or anything? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? No, you didn't find any great rivets or anything like that? No, we, we didn't find any actual tracks or any uh, yokes or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so this is just one of the examples of uh, existing fuel conditions that's causing um, a delay to, to a project. Uh, we found the um, existing water main that was going that has uh, damaged our sewer. Um, so that's part of our extra work um, that we will be doing soon. Um, next slide, pressure, please. So our current operation is uh, we're doing some relocation of gas mains on John Street. And we're relocating some utilities um, along the way as well. Um, also, we're right now we're installing catch basins, uh, manholes, and chutes uh, between Wall Street and John Street. And what we have remaining is uh, the repair of the sewer um, that you saw in the picture, which was on uh, Maiden Lane. Uh, we'll still have uh, about. 18 catch basins to go and the two connections. Um, also, we have yet to start the curb and sidewalk replacements. And we still have street lighting and traffic signals installations and the full uh, roadway reconstruction. And that involves uh, one block of cobblestone, which is between Fletcher Street and John Street. We've had our cobblestone discussion, right? That they're going to be repaired or replaced, hopefully with the existing cobblestone, because you're, go you're going to remove them, right? Yes. Uh, and then replace. Yes. Right now, we're we've removed them, and the contractor has stored them in their yard. Uh, they'll be cleaned and reused, and whatever. Um, if we need new ones, they'll be ordered. Um, so it should go back uh, the way it was before. And right now we're requesting a full uh, street closure from DLT for that block. So we could do a proper job of uh, cobblestone installation. And I mean, we've had this discussion also about the cobblestone. Um, the contractor that's been hired to do the cobblestone, is there a separate contractor? No, it will be the same same contract. Okay. Okay, so you're going to make sure that they're put back the same distance apart that they were before they were removed, right? Yes. Pat? Hey Pat. Yes. Who uh, is it? It's Frankie again. Frankie. So um just to add on to that, you know, the our contractor is fully qualified to do all this cobblestone work. Um they're gonna they're gonna be installed reinstalled back to the spec that the, for the installation that we have. So so you should you shouldn't have to worry. Um, the only thing is we might be accelerating our schedule for cobblestone installation. We might be pushing that up. Um, how we I would say what by, by in a month or so maybe. Correct. We're we're hoping to uh, start in June. But that that's also pending on uh, the kind of work. Um, Correct. So so after after we're out of the intersection of John, um, we're looking to finish the basins, and then we might jump into cobblestone and and, and finish that block. So we do curb sidewalks, um, and cobblestone, including the granite pavers, and then we want to finish that block block and a half from John all the way to Maiden Lane, and then be, be done with that. So 
Okay, so you, you, you might have new cobblestone. You might have new cobblestone by the end of the summer. Okay, that would be great. That would be great. Um, Diane, is your hand still up? Well, it wasn't, but I, I was just about to put it up. I'm just curious. Okay. The only reason I, I mentioned cobblestones before was one of our biggest problems. And I know you say you've had a lot of discussions, but I haven't been uh, in, included. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry to say. Um, the people who did the last job that the city picked, I'm sure you know that they installed the stones in the wrong distance apart from each other and they're all coming up. So I was just hoping that whoever's going to do a new cobblestone work is really vetted by the city before they pay so much money to have stones that don't even last like less than three years is what our our stones lasted downtown uh you know from canal street up and uh it's a shame because the job costs millions and millions of dollars so the, that's the only reason i mentioned cobblestones before because this time i hope the city really focuses on who could do like european style cobblestones with the proper distance between them we had conversation, like I said, but you haven't been here. So they are well aware, right, Frankie? That, okay. uh, yeah, what happened with other cobblestones and, yeah. and also they're going to reuse the material that they're removing. They yeah. just heard that. It's, it was, we're going we're to make sure that uh, the spec is follow 100%, which is, which shouldn't be an issue, you know, with uh, constructability and, 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 and longevity of the stones after they've been installed. Uh, and again, we should be having um, all of this done within the next couple of months. So, so um, we're gonna have a new um, nice looking cobblestone roadway soon. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, how are you done? Let me yeah. just add on to that. So, um, during during the cob one other thing about you know this installation compared to what they did on Hudson. No, part of this installation, the, 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 the request has now, we've put in for city DOT to fully close um, one street from John to Maiden. So, so at least this way we could get one uniform, you know, work and they're carrying, and we have the proper carrying time. So I think, I think part of the problem last time was they kept the road open, half the road. So this time we're looking to close it completely and let it cure, you know, the 21 days before the, the roads even reopen. So that's the request that we, we have put into city DOT. So it's 21 days to cure the cobblestones? Correct. So after after the, all the cobblestones are, are, are laid, you know, we're supposed to keep traffic off of any of the cobblestones for at least 21 days. So that's that's the big push that we're pushing right now for city with city DOT to get to fully close that block to make sure we have sufficient time for it to cure. So, Frankie, how long would it be from start to finish? How long does it take to lay them? How long is it? And then the 21 days. Uh, how we, what, what, what was um, the contractor schedule? I believe he was estimating for the installation to be around three weeks. And the curing time is 21 days. I'm sorry. I, I, so, does that include the 21 days, Alex? No, no, it doesn't. Okay, so it's three weeks to lay them and then 21 days for them to cure. Around, about, yes. Yeah. 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 Everything's approximate, yeah. And, and also weather related, right? Um, weather shouldn't affect it too much as long as um, the motor bed is done properly and okay. they have time to cure. All righty. All right. So anything else? For this project, Howie and Frankie. Um, Frank, um, Howie, I go. Hi, Pat. It's Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Hi. I also wanted just to add quickly that um, as part of the work, when we do as we go along, we also when work is completed, we're also restoring parking. I know it's a big deal within you know from from Old Slip all the way to John. So. As we go, they have been restoring parking and also authorized parking. We have Department of Investigation, so they've gotten most of their parking back from, especially from Pine all the way to John Street. 
So, so up to Fletcher. That is a big problem. So thank you for letting us know that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next project. So our next project is the reconstruction of Beasley Street. Um, better again, there is an engineer on that project. So reconstruction of Beasley Street is between Church Street and Broadway. Uh, projected completion date is September 17, 2024, and percent of work completed is 19% so far. So as you can see, we have our work area on Beasley uh, Street and our storage area is located on Broadway. Scope of work is installation of catch basins, installation of sewer, cleanup manhole, and chutes. Uh, water main is raised from 12 inches to 20 inches. And as other DDC projects, this is a, a joint bid project with uh, Condition and ECS. So we also will be working on upgrading all the utilities, just like gas, electric, and uh, ECS, Verizon conduits. We also will be upgrading the street lighting and the traffic signal works, six inch granite curb installation, pigmented sidewalk installation, and pedestrian ramps upgrades. Over the last uh, two months, we installed a cast in place catch basin on the northeast corner of Beasy and Church Street. Uh, also, we abated. Uh, Two uh, steam services that had a lot of asbestos. It was done by Con Edison crews. And also, we are locating two five inch electrical conduits that in indirect interferences with the water mining work. Uh, one thing why we were chasing these uh, conduits, Con Edison discovered an oil leak from their oil static lines. Uh, we have been working over all uh, the past two weekends to uh, weld the leak and uh, take control of it. They finished uh, welding the oil static. And this weekend, uh, they will be working on uh, removing all the, all the contaminated soil from the intersection. And- Well, that was contaminated with the oil. Yes. Uh, also for that intersection, uh, we have on May 7, the five borough bike tour and all the excavated uh, location will be backfilled and paved before the event. Oh, are you, so you're not plating it over? You'll be finished with it before the event? No, we will not be finished. So it took uh, most of the time we spend it removing the concrete base. We will not be restoring concrete base. It will be a clean backfill and we will just pave it. As you can see in the picture, we cannot lower the plates anymore. All of these utilities are very shallow. So we don't have room to drop the plates and pave over the plates. So we will have a detailed discussion this Saturday, actually, with Con Edison and the contractor to see what's our options. But we have to have the intersection paved before the uh, bike tour. All right. Lucian has a question. Sure. But sorry, it's, it sounds like. Other workarounds may not be available due to the shallowness of these of these utilities. But you know, as always, uh, CB1 is uh, standing by to assist in, in in helping you go whatever route uh, uh, to create the, the 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 least amount of delay for this project. Um, we you know we want this to be uh, not delayed uh, any more than it has to be. And as in as we have in times past, uh, we'll go to bat. To, to advocate and whatever you all think is the best way to go forward on this. I appreciate that, Lucian, and we'll definitely reach out. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, backfilling this trench and paving over it will not delay the project as this is very small. To be honest, most of the delays we are having is because of the utility interferences. And uh, as I mentioned before in the previous progress meetings, uh, we are dealing with the aftermath of 9-11 and every time can Edison go to a vault or to a manhole they find structural defects which is delaying the project can Edison crews cannot go to the vault to do their work unless this vault is repaired and this was not anticipated in the design phase oh yes this year would you just tell me again what the estimated completion date is 
Uh, it's uh, in September 2024, September 17th. I also, Anything? I still have some pictures for you. Uh, we also install upgraded the gas main from six inches to eight inches. You can see on the left left picture. That is that beautiful new blue pipe, the gas. The green pipe yes. is the gas. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. And, and we had to do a tie in and uh, switch the service for the deli uh, on 26 B Street, so they do not we do not interrupt their service. So we did all that work without interrupting any service on the block. Yeah. Uh, we also removed some electrical cables and electrical conduits uh, for Con Edison. They were in direct interference with our water main upgrade installation. And that, that was the work that was done in the past two months. If you have any question, I'm ready to answer. Anyone? Nope. Great. You do, and I don't need to speak up. No? Nope. Oh. That's great. See Richard has his hands up. Richard? Richard? I'm sorry. So we need to be unmuted? I, I see Richard Peterson has his hand up. I don't know what. No, yes, no. I just raised it to be on the board for the when it's our turn. Oh, oh, you're you're moved over to panels, Richard. You're good to go. Okay. Richard, did you Who's have up? a question? Who's up next? Okay, up next. Who's going next project? Thanks, Michelle. All right, next project we have reconstruction of Nastri. I believe we have Nurbro with us to present. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for the waiting round. Last but not least, I think. Um, so I, I, I figured that last time when we spoke, uh, we'd be started by now, but we have not, unfortunately. Uh, the contract is waiting to start in the next couple of weeks. Um, they, they they were still waiting on MT insurance and a couple of DOT permits, uh, but they are ready to go and most likely they will be starting end of April, early May. Um, yeah, you can push over. And just to, just to go over the, the scope of the project, I, I mentioned last time, but it's the three blocks between Pine Street and Main Lane. We're upgrading new granite curbs and sidewalks. We we're, we're installing ADA ramps, um, new catch basins, a new waiting signs, street lights, and of course new concrete base, asphalt, and and we're doing a bunch of utility work uh, for Con and ECS as my uh, counterparts spoke before. So. Uh, for the most part, this project um, sh should be highway and non non restrictive in terms of water main and utility work. Uh, I know we met with Lucien uh, a couple weeks ago. Thank you for meeting with us, Lucien. Um, but we, the biggest thing that the contractor right now is trying to get a shutdown for the full tree closure. Um, He's asking for. Uh, can you, Bashir? Can you next slide? If, if you can, yeah. So he's asking for full closure for Nassau Street between Pine Street and Cedar. That's. They, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pat. You know, you know, I'm gonna get upset with this one, and and and. Um, no, no, of course, and, yes. So what what does that mean? Full clo full closure. All day, every day, for amount of days or weeks. What does that mean? So the, the issue is that these streets are very narrow, and there's a lot of utility work that has to be done. Um, some of these streets are 23 feet wide, and in terms of DOT, they require 11 feet uh, wide street after hours for 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 trucks and and, and traffic to be allowed. 
it's almost impossible for the for the contractor to allow that while you know maintaining their work site and, and mpt and whatnot and the block between for instance between liberty and maiden is 16 feet wide it's almost impossible for them to actually uh work on that block and keep the lane open so they're requesting to have full shutdowns for the blocks uh, one at a time while they're working on the blocks. Uh, for now, they're still working on the approvals. I know DOT is kind of iffy about it because it, it kind of messes with the whole, um, the, the traffic, traffic in the neighborhood. Of course, yeah. But to I be fair- I'm on Cedar between, well, two blocks between Trinity and Greenwich. And so truthfully, you know, when you make that turn on Pine, you make the right turn onto Nassau and then you make the left turn onto Cedar and that's our path home. So if that block is closed, how do we get onto Cedar? And you know, we have to go all the way around, which has been happening since 9-11. Anyway, you'll let us know. I'm sure you'll be hearing from Rosa Chen who lives right there on the corner. <laughs> she isn't here tonight. Of course, but of course, since of course. we're not starting for another two months, that means that by the time we come, you come back two months from now, you'll have more information. Of course. Now, to be fair, you know, we, we talked with the Stock Exchange, Security and National Park Service, the FedEx office there, Federal Reserve, all, all the, you know, big building managers, they're right. all okay with, with, you know, with the shutdown of the street and, and, and the detour, but it's it's going to be a hassle, but the contractor feels like they're not going to be able to do the work efficiently if they don't, if you know, if they keep. But, sorry to interrupt, but you know why they're okay. They don't live here. They don't have to get groceries. They don't have to get. Of course. Elderly. And that's why that's why, of course, that's why we're trying to work with you know community, make sure that everybody's involved and and whatnot, but. To, to be as efficient as possible with the work, we're, we're going to try to make sure that they, they, they do the work as efficiently as possible for the block and they move on to the next block and next block and whatnot. But so you know, um, we want everything done quickly and we don't want to be inconvenient. Right. I work in that, right? <laughs> right. So, okay. So, so they're more. planning. So, so they're planning on starting in late April, early May, and they're going to be doing test pits, most likely uh, various locations. And they're, they're going to start working between Pine and Cedar. And once they have the approval for the closure, if they get the approval, they'll be working on that block first. And that's a basic uh, outline of the detour that they proposed. And how long do you think this project will take? The completion is June, the completion is June of 25. Um, the contractor has not submitted their schedule yet, but they're going to do it in segments. So when they finish a block, they move on to the next block, and so on. Well, again, we will continue to talk. And if they if they if they uh, start the work before you come back, would you please let Lucian know? Of course, of I know course. you're doing. The, the buildings. I don't remember what um, what the address is on the corner. Rose's address is, but she's right there on the corner of Pine and and Nassau. You know that yes. residential and, and, building. Yes, and Tashima is not available today, but she she's in, she has contacts with everybody in the community. She we, we met with Lucian, and and she has everybody. You know, everybody's right. aware of the shutdown and the detour and 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 the whatnot. So so when when the contractor starts. You will get notifications and whatnot, but thank you. No problem. Hi, Pat. Yes, yeah, there is a CCO on this project, Tashima. She is on the call, but she um, is not able to speak. But she is uh, the liaison on the project. She will provide notices before work starts and any impacts as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I know you guys do your outreach and and you know, but you know, like I said, we want to complain anyway. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. So anything else about this project right now? Not yet. We'll, we'll we'll have more updates when when we actually get started. Thanks, Norbert. Uh, uh, Norbert, the solution. Uh, have you had any luck um, reaching the um, Federal Reserve? 
Yes, we okay. we got we got uh, John. I think it's John from Federal Reserve. We we've talked with the FedEx office. We got uh, the stock exchange. We we basically got everybody on the three blocks okay with the detour and the shutdown. Okay. Oh, you know. Uh, all right. I have a question. So you're not going up to Am Street. You're just between um, you're between Pine and and Maiden Lane. Because now that we've had this collapse, we don't know what this building, you know, because it's between Nassau and um, William, you know, but it's on Anne. So now with this collapse, we have no idea what, how this is going to impact anything. And I'm sure you guys don't know because it just happened yesterday. So, uh, you know, we'll just keep talking, right? Right. We have no idea. No, no, we have no. Yeah, that's yesterday. You know, they're going to have to chuck out all that material. And so we'll just see. All right. Anybody? Is there another project? Is that the last project? Uh, we still have one upcoming project. And we will have Lewis, the engineer in charge, to talk about it. Lewis, are you with us? Thank you, Richard. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. So the next project is upcoming, which we are expecting to start in early fall this year is the reconstruction of Trinity a place between Cedar Street and Morris Street. Next slide. Okay. So the scope of the work will be like reconstruction of four block in Trinity Place, replacement of only three block of combined sewer, redo the curb and sidewalk like we've been doing in downtown Manhattan, Reconstruction of ADA, alleviate the drainage, adding new cash basin, only upgrading the hydrant, we're not doing any water main, and it's a joint big project along with ECS and Con Edison. Any questions? Yeah, so Lewis, I'm sorry, I missed yeah. it's from, um, it's on Trinity between, from Cedar to where? Peter Morris. Morris. Yes. Okay. So, um, all right. So Trinity's not that wide. Are you doing one side of the street? Do you have to do? Is it in the middle? Where Where is the work taking place? On both sides in the middle? Most of the work is side work and curb. We only have to do like three block of a uh, sewer. That will be in the mirror, but then it's like three small blocks. You know, those blocks are not even that big. So mm -hmm. we're not yeah. expecting affect the traffic that much. Probably we're taking like the parking lane, leaving one lane open all the time. Okay, so on I mean, we have, I'm trying to think, there's still work going on because of the um, old American Stock Exchange building. You know, they're doing work. And so on the west side of the street, uh, right? On the west side of the street, there is, well, I don't know when that project is going to be finished. Bruce, I, can you jump in and are you have any Actually, help with this it? project, it was just like bid. It hasn't been awarded. So we are expecting early fall to start, but we will have to coordinate with another contractor in there, yes, one we're ready to NTP the project. Okay, well, you'll be back in a m two months to tell us what's going on. Yes, hopefully in two months, we're gonna have a starting day NTP and contract duration. Okay, great, all right. Because I, I live, like I said, I live on Cedar between Trinity and Greenwich, so I'm right there. So all of my neighbors are gonna wanna know what's going on. <laughs> So, anyway, so you okay. will see me often in there. <laughs> I will come up and say hi. <laughs> More than welcome. Great, thank you, Lewis. Anytime. And uh, I'll just I just want to add that um, very very early on, um, uh, the the team met with uh, the administration of PS150 and talked about sensitive times of the year. Uh, and, and to give them good guidance on when they should prioritize the work adjacent to the school as to minimize disruption 
of the school year. Um, and their team is also engaged with Trinity Church as well. So yes. uh, those are two, you know, very uh, important stakeholders. Uh, but again, you know, we CB1 always stands ready to help uh, with making additional connections. And then um, it's probably enough time has elapsed to talk to PS150 again, um, since now they've, they've been operating in the building for a while. Right. Yes, Lucian, you're right. correct. We got a meeting with the church. We asked them for the sensitive date, but at, at the moment, we are not coordinating anything because we don't got REI on board. So once we got a CCL on board, we will be in contact with the school and the church and they're going to provide us with the dates and we will forward it to the contractor. And, and like I said, the former American Stock Exchange building, I mean, they're doing interior work, but I don't know, you know they're, they're, they're bringing materials. Listen, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, I, I do, I do, yes. And they, they will be, and, and likely, um, and that's a great point, they, they may be uh, prioritizing the use of the rear of the building um, to move materials in and out. So uh, it's something that we definitely need to look at. Uh, for sure. Uh, at least Ed, Ed, this that. is Dushyant. Uh, sorry, Pat. This is Dushyant. Uh, for Trinity Place, we have the MFM contractor. The is uh, has won the contract. So is it, it is the same contractor that work on a uh, Broadway Phase One from uh, Rector to End Street, and we coordinate with Saint Paul Church and the Trinity Place. We accommodate their uh, uh, events. So I don't see any uh, issue regarding the coordination when the work starts. The yeah, contractor is very good. I'm yes. sure, but I was just saying, you know, the former American Stock Exchange building, they're doing interior construction. And so they, I know they're moving. I, I'm sure you've done outreach to them already, or maybe Hi, not. Pat. Hi, Pat, this is Marlene. We can touch base with um, Lucian and if it's possible, provide contact information for those. Um, yeah. Places. I, I know we've spoken to PS150 already, but any other contacts you deem important, we can always reach out to them in advance of the work starting. Yeah, because um, it's, it's a great point because if there's going to be any sidewalk work on the uh, on the east side of Trinity, uh, you may want to get word to them before they throw a sidewalk shed up um, if they're going to do any kind of that work. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you for the heads up. It hasn't started yet, so I'm sure you'll do your outreach and, and Lucian will help with one, whatever and, and yeah, great. Thank you. Any any other projects? Um, before before we move on to uh, the uh, uh, MDC, I just want to make sure Scott gets to go because Scott's always, he's not DDC, but he's always patiently there uh, and it's a very similar project. Well, let me just ask. Everyone from GDC, are you? That's it. Those are the projects. That's yes, it. Everyone that's that's yes. So, thank you. You know, thank you so much. I'm sorry you had to wait. We, we really appreciate you coming every other month and filling us in on projects and being sensitive to the issues of the community. You all are great. I really do appreciate you. So thank you. So go okay. and enjoy the rest. Have a good night. Come back to next. Take care. Bye bye. And bye. Thanks. Scott, where are you? Good evening, Pat, Lucy, and everyone. How's everybody? Uh, we're well. How are you? Good, good, good. Friday's almost here. <laughs> yeah, not soon enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes, I'm the CCL for the Water Street Project. Uh, currently, we have four open locations. The first one being at the intersection of Water and Whitehall, where we're continuing to work on Con Ed's electrical facilities. Our second location, Water Street between Broad and Puente Slip. Uh, we're continuing uh, excavating the roadway and sidewalk to install Con Ed's electrical duct system. The third location, Water between Puente Slip and Hanover, uh, we're also doing the same work. Uh, digging the roadway and sidewalk for the installation to relocate Con Ed's electrical duct system. And last but not least, 
uh, Water Street between Wall and Pine. Uh, we're continuing to dig to install for Con Ed's 24 inch steel gas main. I also wanted uh, to make a note that we've also coordinated uh, this week with uh, DLT special events for the upcoming five barrel bike tour, which is going to take place on um, Sunday, May 7th. So we look forward to that event. And the last thing that I have to report is our eighth installment of our project newsletter will go out tomorrow morning and that's all i have if anybody has any questions um please feel free to ask anyone I don't see any hands scott you might be getting away scott free <laughs> i don't see hands and if you just needed um our anticipated end date is now june of 2025 you? We're going to be together for a while, Scott. Yes. Yep. Definitely. Well, we in good company. Come and join us, though. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anything else? Then thanks again and enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you month after next. Thank you. You do the same. Talk to you later. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Uh -huh. All right. What? Do we have anything else on our agenda? Are we done? MDC. Oh. A drone boy could first Lauren? A little closer to the ground. Hey, Lauren. Yep, I'm right here. How are you? Um, so just a quick shout out to anyone else in the BBJ team who um, it, well, is planning or anticipating speaking during Q&A. If you haven't been moved over as a panelist, please raise your hand um, and, and Lucian will move you over. I think we got most people. Um, and up front, thank you to the community board. I applaud all of you, your endurance, um, and thank you so much for you know sticking around and having us here this evening. I will share my screen and pull the presentation up. Full screen. All right, are you all seeing the presentation full screen now? Okay, yeah. great. Great, thank you. All right, so it's a similar agenda to what we've presented in past months. Um, we'll do a recap of what we've heard in, in previous meetings and updates on those topics. Um, then I will hand it off to Richard Peterson from Gramercy to go through the dismantle project updates. Um, and then we'll finish with, uh, he'll hand it back to me. We'll talk about community engagement and upcoming um, engagement touch points, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Since a lot of the slides uh, this time are repeats from past meetings, Rich and I are gonna try to move through things really quickly. Uh, for the sake of time, but of course, during Q and A, if there's anything that we glossed over or went through too quickly, and you want us to pull back up another slide uh, and talk through some of the technical detail, we're we're happy to do so. So, what we've heard, um, so as as always, we know questions about the the project budget always come up, and what's the new facility going to be. Um, so again, at present, there has been no change, um, but when, if and when that does change in the future, we'll be sure to let everybody know. Um, so for, for now, there's no update on that. Um, updates on the FOIL requests. I believe at the moment we are current on all requests, so there's nothing outstanding. Um, but of course, Lucian, if I'm missing anything, let me know and we'll, we'll get to work on that right away. Um, for environmental monitoring, so we'll have the, the latest monthly updates on slides 10 and 11. And again, we always post our environmental monitoring reports online every month. Um, which is ongoing concerns around road and control. So we'll recap that as usual on slide 12 and what we're doing on the site. Last time we were here two months ago, um, I think the biggest concerns and a lot of our discussion focused around night work. At the time, we were just starting a series of um, small steps and small tasks that needed to be done at night because they involved uh, opening up the street and impacting traffic. Um, so we're happy to say, you know, we, we heard everyone's concerns about that. We went back. To DOT a few times, um, Rich and his team were great about really pursuing this and doing everything we could. So we we were able, we were successful in um, getting permits to do a number of those things during weekend daytime hours. So we still couldn't get weekday daytime hours to do the work, but we were able to do it during the day on weekends to minimize the impact to the community. So um, thank you all for bearing with us and raising your concerns at that meeting, and we'll we'll continue to try to address things as much as we possibly feasibly can. Uh, we're going to hand it off to America from the mayor's office. So we so actually, let me just say up front, 
uh, number six, seven, and eight, these are all topics that they're not really quality of life committee issues, but we have been asked by the committee and community members in the past to just address these up front since we, we know that they're topics. So we'll speak to these um, here and give you the, the information, the updates that we have available at this time. So America, can you speak to number six? Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Uh, at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we work with law enforcement, city agencies, not-for-profits, foundations, and the public to implement data-driven anti-crime strategies and promote the operation of a fair justice system. Uh, we work with multiple partners on comprehensive citywide network of diversion and re-entry services that address a variety of social service needs among, among justice-involved individuals including the need for sustainable employment opportunities while also addressing other social service needs, which may include education, housing, counseling, healthcare, and family services. At MockJ, we use data analysis to implement programs and services to lower the jail population by one, diverting individuals from jail through supervised release and alternatives to um, incarceration programs, by lowering the amount of time a person is detained on Rikers through case processing processes, including population review teams, uh, by preventing recidivism, by offering re-entry programs to individuals post-incarceration. These programs focus on providing paid transitional employment, job training, access to higher education, and supportive services. The MockJ research innovation and policy teams have also teamed up with NYPD, the Department of Correction, and Office of Course of Court Administration's data teams to drill down into the city's most challenging public safety matters and are working on ways to employ a more precise response to address this population's behavior and needs through more active and stringent supervision while they're out of jail, housing, mental health care, and trauma-informed therapeutic supports to help guide better responses to difficult situations and stressors. In terms of a plan B, uh, the mayor Adams has said that his priority is the health and safety of all New Yorkers and the law states that Rikers must close. Major Adams has said that any path forward must be in full compliance with the law. And while we may not currently be at a jail population number that would allow us to close Rikers right now, we're not set, set to shift to borough based jails for several years. As this administration continues to invest in supervised release, alternatives to incarceration, and transitional housing programs, we're looking at all available contingencies should the need to implement them arise. Thanks. Thanks, America. Um, for the next point, um, we're aware that there was a request and a push from some members of the community, as well as some local elected officials for our team to consider adaptive reuse. Um, rather than dismantling the existing facility and also to pause on dismantle activities while that's under consideration. So our city team collectively, and that includes City Hall, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and DOC, um, has assessed and determined that adaptive reuse is not appropriate for this particular project. Um, and so we are continuing with dismantle. We're continuing with the project as previously approved. Um, and finally, we got a question last time about which committee within city council uh, is responsible for overseeing the BBJ program. So it's the committee of criminal justice that oversees uh, DOC and, and all of these operations. So, all right, so thank you for that recap or for hearing that recap. And now we'll move on to the regular presentation. Um, so I'll turn it over to Richard Peterson to go through some updates on the dismantle project. Can everybody see me? I can Lynn. hear you, Richard. I can right, hear you. I don't see. Oh, there now you go. I can see you. Now we see you. Hi, Richard. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Rich Peterson uh, with Gramercy Group here to give you an update on the dismantlement project at the BBJ. So, right now, and I apologize, my, I'm on my phone tonight, so everything's a little bit smaller on my screen. Um, as everyone knows, site assessments and surveys have been completed and the site fencing has been installed. Interim Sally Port construction is underway and is expected to wrap up uh, towards the end of May. Internal work within the courthouse is also expected to wrap up towards the end of May. And the dismantle work, uh, which is ongoing, uh, is expected to work until the end of April of 24. Um, we are currently wrapping up interior soft demo and beginning the 
gym and commercial space. This is an existing layout of the current site. Um, as you can see, the red indicates our existing uh, site fencing. The blue hatched represents the sidewalk sheds. And the on the lower right corner is where the interim sally port is being constructed in the lime green outline um, with the construction fencing surrounding that in black. Uh, once the interim sally port is completed, the south tower will be encompassed within the site as well as the existing sally port. Um, as you can see, the sidewalk shed will continue a little further south on Center Street, as well as the fencing on Baxter and Center. Here are some current pictures of the existing site conditions. Um, as you can see, the sally port on the far left, the sidewalk shed on Center um, in the center, and the scaffolding that is going up on the North Tower on your right. Uh, pink boxes indicate the road and control bait stations, which are monitored monthly and are continuously monitored. Um, as I state every month, if anyone sees anything or has any uh, observations, please advise us and we can address that immediately. Uh, environmental monitoring stations, we monitor for vibration, noise, and air quality. The different stations are shown at their locations here on the right, um, indicated by the squares, circles, and triangles. And there's been no exceedances that uh, in these projects, uh, I believe on the next slide, is going to tell you through uh, the current time. Asbestos abatement has been completed. So as while well, this is relevant because it just finished up, asbestos air monitoring had no leaks uh, to their monitors as well. And I'll hand it back to Lauren. Great. All right. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate that. All right, uh, for community engagement, so one update that we have to share is that the commercial metered parking space um, that we were coordinating with CB3 and with DOT to establish that space, and that's to alleviate uh, some of the impact on the local businesses and restaurants. So there's a designated commercial metered parking space um, for use by vehicles that are delivering goods and materials to the local businesses that are essential uh, for them to carry out their activities. Uh, that's been installed now, so that's a, an update we're happy to share, um, and we'll probably stop tracking this particular item moving forward. But thank you all again, all, um, everyone, for bearing with us. Uh, we flagged all of this um, almost a year ago, and it you know it took a little time to get in place, but we really appreciate this being brought to our attention and then being able to um, help with some of the coordination where we could to get this established. Uh, in terms of upcoming community meetings, so our next neighborhood advisory committee meeting will be on Monday, the 24th of April. Um, we put a link here. So those meetings, um, well, they're open specifically to NAC members in order to, to participate, but members of the public. So anyone who's, who's not on the NAC membership list, um, you're still able to uh, see the meeting take place in real time via the live stream link. We also record all of those meetings and we do post those recordings up on our website. Um, typically within a day or two of the meeting actually taking place. So anyone can see what's happening and what the conversation is in those meetings. Um, our community board presentations like this will be ongoing throughout design and construction. We appreciate you hosting us roughly every other month. Um, and finally, we have our ongoing Chinatown stakeholder briefings. The next meeting is scheduled for May 17th. And as a reminder, those briefings, the, the meeting materials are Usually the same presentations that we're giving to all of you at the community board, um, but we do provide a, a deck that's been translated into Chinese. Uh, and finally, this is a, just a reminder for everyone of the resources that are available um, during construction, even in between these touch points. And you have our CCL's contact information and hours and address uh, listed here. This is also always available on our website. All right, well, that's the conclusion of our presentation and we'll open it up for Q and A. Thanks, Pat. Alice is here. Alice. You can go first, Alice, if you have any questions or comments. Uh, sure, thanks uh, all. Um, yeah, a few questions. Could you, uh, you know, as this is an update for quality of life, it would be helpful just to flesh out stuff a little bit more, Lauren, if you don't mind. So what is the budget currently for the demolition? I know you said we had received this update, but just for those of us who don't remember or might want to know for the record. 
Um, that's a really good question. If you let me pull, I don't have it on. The it's it's one hundred twenty five million. Great, thank you. So that hasn't increased at all. No, it's not increased. No, no, it hasn't changed. Okay, thanks. Um, just to be clear, and Lucian will share this with you, we we actually haven't received all the documents that we foiled for, um, specifically the correspondence from SHPO and LPC. So, I guess uh, Lucian can follow up with you on that. Um, okay, thanks for so on good. the adaptive re reuse. I'd love a little more information. As you know, this has been something that many people and many electeds have been pushing for. And could you make provide a few details? So, again, who makes this? Who made this decision? And when was the decision made? So, could you be specific on that one? Sure. So, this is a collective decision made by City Hall, Mock J, and DOC. Um, and I think that decision was just announced. Yesterday, and could you tell us why? And is that something that's been written down, or something we can all read or review? Well, we've had a we've had a couple of meetings now with um, a number of elected officials and with community groups, as you're aware. And I think we've gone through the rationale and the reasoning behind this decision. Um, so it pertains to there's you know a number of laws, codes, and regulations. Um, that really make this not an applicable solution for this project uh, in order for us to comply with all of the updated codes and regulations, as well as local law 194 um, that really establishes the design guidelines and what we're trying to achieve on the BBJ program. Um, adaptive reuse is, is not a more viable option than what we're proceeding with, with dismantling the facility and rebuilding the borough base jail. You know, as you're aware, of course, where we had, you know, one of the top architects in New York representing the architectural community at a recent meeting, you know, he would beg to differ, um, you know, and there was a certain amount of hope and conversation that maybe we would be looking at, you know, more details on this. I guess at a minimum, I would ask that, you know, on behalf of the community and the many people involved and, you know, in the hope that to save, um, you know, the historic building and, and, and to save the waste that's involved in this project, um, you know, a, a slightly, well, at least a, a written statement um, that examines, you know, with detail exactly how this decision again was made and why. And I appreciate the summary you provided, but I wonder if we could uh, impress upon the office to give us a little bit more so that we have something that really we all can kind of dive into a little bit more if that's possible. Um, you know, speaking on behalf of the community, I, Appreciate that. Um, Understood. We'll certainly make sure that that request is shared with um, all of our city partners. Thanks, Lauren. Um, just a couple of other questions. Um, did you receive the demo permits for this building from the built department of building? Um, Sorry. Yes, we have received a full demo permit. Okay. And are there any um, state or federal discretionary actions? Or funding or licenses that are, come with this demolition, is is there anything on the state or federal level, or is it entirely city? Just curious. Um, Rich, is that something you can speak to, or Anil? Um, I'm not exactly sure of the question. The, the permit for demolition comes from New York City. No, that's not the question. It's that does the proposed demolition involve any state or federal discretionary action, funding, licenses, or permits? Uh, as I understand, the city of New York has to sanction this with their Department of Building, but is there any other agency at the state or federal level that, um, you know, requires any discretionary action other than? So, asbestos was notified uh, to the state, but beside the EPA, but that is all. So. So this, there's only one state permit that was required, and that was for the asbestos removal, and that's it for the demolition. There's no other state or federal action for demolition. No. Okay. Um. Sorry, I'm just going down the. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the request I've made and the questions that I've asked are it for now. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Howard. Hello. Hi, can you hear Howard? me? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alice asked most of my questions about the permits. Um, I find it disappointing about the adaptive reuse, and then I also like to get more information on why they couldn't work and 
and and get a more detailed explanation. Um, besides saying it just didn't meet current standards, you know, why why couldn't it, why why couldn't we make it meet those standards? You know, if we could get a a, a better explanation for that, uh, we, that'd be much appreciated. Um, the only other thing is the uh, is there a timeline uh, for the demo and the project? I know Brooklyn BBJ is slated to be finished in 29 and that's the first project and that means um, this project is the last and we're talking about probably 30, 31 or later as far as when this project is done. And the reason I ask this is that, um, you know, NUBC has gotten feedback from a lot of residents, you know, the young and mobile are just thinking about moving, you know, because they don't want to put up with the noise and the construction and and the seniors are just hoping they could last to the end of the project. So um, uh, that's that's the feeling we get from the from the community. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We understand, Howard. I I know. Um, I think all of us as New Yorkers know that uh, enduring construction projects, especially in the vicinity of our homes, um, you know, it's a really trying experience and it's difficult. So. That is what our team is here for and our CCO. We're gonna work with you guys to try to mitigate the impacts to the extent that we, we can. Um, that said, of course, construction is disruptive and that is the nature of it. So um, please keep us informed. A, a number of you have been when you're um, noticing a particular source of noise that you think could, you know, could that be relocated? We've done that a few times with some machinery. We're trying to stay vigilant and think of these things ahead of time, but we do appreciate all of you communicating and sending your requests directly to our CCL. Um, Nikita's great. She's very proactive at getting these things in front of um, Richard and Anil and our team to, to try to see where we can make adjustments as we go. Um, but again, it is it is impactful. Um, so as far as the timeline, um, as Richard shared earlier, the dismantle process is going to go on through spring of 2024. Um, we're currently looking at April of 2024. We don't know the facility timeline yet. We're in the procurement process right now and as part of procurement. Um, proposers put together, um, you know, they're, they're assessing what it would take to complete this project and they're putting together design and construction timelines. So once we're further along in that process and um, we have, a, you know, a selected proposal and we're ready to share that information, we'll update all of you as to what that timeline looks like. Um, I know that the information about Brooklyn has come out. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be exactly what we're looking at for Manhattan. Um, so we just, we won't know until we get there, but we will absolutely share that information as soon as we have it available. Any other questions, comments, questions? Anyone from the public? Yes, we have two questions from the pub. Two questions from the public, uh, Anna and Jonathan Hollander. I can take those. Uh, Jonathan Hollander, you can unmute. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Lauren, I, I wonder, maybe this was covered in an earlier meeting, but has there been a written report in terms of the impact on Columbus Park in terms of air pollution, dust, and potentially needing to close down the park? So a, a written report for Columbus Park is not something that our team would produce. I don't know if there was an independent study. Um, that said, we do have, we, we are taking the air quality issue very seriously. We have air monitors that are surrounding the perimeter of the site. And so we're monitoring it, you know, at where the source is actually, where, where anything would be emanating from and catching it basically at the source. So to date, our air monitors have not picked up anything that is exceeding levels as set by the EPA. Um, we haven't even approached what, we're, what we would consider the action levels where we have to stop work and reassess work activities, but we are monitoring this. It's an ongoing process. Um, and if there's, if there's cause for concern, we will absolutely alert the community. And I have 1 other question that could be naive, sure. but the question is, um, what if the city runs out of money? This is a massively expensive project, which many people have pointed out is, um. At a time when the city is is not flush with cash and when uh, budgets are being cut for the Department of Education and so forth. So I just wondered um, in terms of the, the actual funding, is it all in place for the entire project from start to finish? 
Um, so I think is someone available from city hall who can address this question. I can say, generally speaking, that the city is committed um, to building the borough based jails program. But that's not really an answer to my question. Understood. Um, America, are you still there? And Lauren, I can jump in. This is Jeff okay. from DDC. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the city doesn't allocate the city allocates funding based on the fiscal year when the money will be spent. So we are uh, putting the money in place again, based on the order of the. Facilities, the borough based jail facilities. So, as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, Brooklyn is 1st, and it will proceed as the next will be Bronx, Queens, and then Manhattan. So. Again, the, the money gets allocated as it's needed based on how the city manages its capital projects. Okay, Pat, um, the next person from the public with their hand up is Anna. Okay. Anna, you're able to unmute now. I wanted to know why do some businesses get a 10 day notice of demolition and who got that notice? Uh, I have a notice here that says March 15th. And uh, it says 10 day partial demolition notice to adjoining property owner uh, to whom it may concern. Please be advised that Gramercy will be installing support of excavation at the above reference building adjacent to your property. This letter is issued as a requirement and a formality for processing the Department of Buildings permit and work will begin once the Department of Buildings permit is issued. So why did some businesses get it and some not? And then who got that notice? So that that is a formal requirement from the Department of Buildings um, as it's maybe not so clear in the letter, but as part of the process for obtaining the, perm the permits to dismantle the building, uh, Gramercy, the contractor is required by DOB to issue a letter to adjacent properties. So it's, it's properties who basically abut the boundary of our site and where we're working. Um, so it's a, it's just a formal requirement that it has, to, those letters have to go out. Um, we are also alerting other residents and other community members to upcoming work through our neighborhood notification network. And we include this information in our weekly bulletins and other things that are upcoming. So I know that some folks got the notice and then. Work didn't necessarily commence exactly 10 days after that, but it's a, it's an anticipated timeline and it's part of the permit approval process. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, 10 days, uh, has expired quite a while ago. So are they going to get an updated notice or what's. What's happening? So uh, updates about, um. Up upcoming construction activity are included in our weekly construction bulletins that our CCL Nikita sends out every Friday. Um, so the, the, the 10 day notification that goes out, it basically means that work wouldn't be starting in less than 10 days, but in 10 days, or at some point after that, the, as soon as the permit essentially is secured and that letter is a prerequisite for getting the permit, it, it is a little bit confusing. I had to have rich explain it to me a few times myself. Um, but it is part of the process. And so they are beginning the dismantle of the, the gymnasium structure. It's the lower level structure, not the tall tower. Um, that's that work is actually starting this week. They're starting to work on the roof. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, we now we have a question from Jan Lee. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, actually, um, we have uh, some member Grace Lee uh, put her hand up. So, Pat, I probably yeah. So remember. Hi. How are you? Um, so I have a representative on the on the call and they just let me know what uh, what was being shared and I apologize if I'm not getting all the details right, but it sounds like the there is uh, some decision to make that to have the demolition going for it. So myself, Senator Kavanaugh, who's actually in my office with me right now, uh, as well as the borough president and the city council member Christopher Marte had a meeting with the DDC and community members where the DDC had promised that we would be receiving documentation to justify their decision 
uh, for moving forward with the jail. We did not receive all of that documentation. We were also promised a follow-up meeting to discuss this further. So I think that we are incredibly disappointed that we are hearing that this demolition is going to move forward without another meeting with our community, without the documentation to support moving forward with the plan as is. And we'd like to know from the DDC when we will be receiving that documentation. We would also like to see that this demolition is halted until we have that next meeting. Hi, assembly member. This is Jeff Margolis from DDC. Uh, so I attended the meeting on March 2nd uh, with you and your colleagues from Manhattan. Uh, it's my recollection I actually helped facilitate some of the information being transferred to your office and your colleagues through the senator's office and the borough president's office. So I believe all the documents you requested were provided. Uh, I, I could be mistaken if I'm missing something. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but the request was for the HABS report. Um, and Lauren, if, or anyone else, if you could let me know what else I may be missing. I believe we. The HABS report, the CPSD study. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So those were the two major document requests uh, that we provided. Again, to be fair, it wasn't immediately after that meeting, but it was a few, it was about two weeks after we had to go through process with the Department of Correction uh, and they're also on as well if they have anything to add but there were just some some information because the current uh, South Tower is still in use so there were just some uh, concerns they had about security that we had to address but we provided both those documents to your offices and hopefully they made it to you directly in terms of the follow-up meeting again this was a collective decision by City Hall, DOC, DDC, and Mount Jay to move forward with the current plan as is based on the information we shared in that meeting with you, based on the regulations, laws, et cetera, that require us to build this facility up to code and the extensive work that would have been required to, uh, you know, adapt to have adaptive reuse here. So. So That's during where we the stand. meeting, we talked. Your the DDC had discussed how they had reviewed the possibility of adaptive reuse, and that you had documentation to show that you had considerations around that. So uh, what I I mean are those documents that you provided to our office the only documentation that you have of adaptive of your considerations of adaptive reuse. A lot, yes, the review and the, some of the folks that were in the room at the time, obviously the commissioner, uh, Eduardo Del Valle, who heads up the borough-based jobs program, associate commissioner, Beverly Pryor, who is uh, the lead from our program management team, Acom Hill, they have done additional reviews based on their own personal experiences with the facilities. Uh, but there are no further documents that we have at this time to share with you. I have Senator Kavanaugh here as well. So if you want to just jump in there. Hi, on you. We're busy doing the budget up here. So just, but just again, I, my, you know, we appreciated the tone and substance of that meeting and the city made specific commitments at that meeting that you would provide whatever information we had and then we would have further conversations about the community's desire that there be some kind of a RFP to determine whether there's anybody out there that thinks this that this is possible and you know, adaptive for use and that you'd provide us with documentation and then having provided that aggravation, which de was denied over the course of the prior administration when this decision was made that we would have a further conversation and there were firm commitments to that and the commissioner uh, and others told us that uh, you know they wanted to be a reset and wanted to really have a collaborative process with the um, with the community and with the local elected officials and just you know hearing about this now you know we're not there in person or 
even, you know, I frankly wasn't on before now because we're busy trying to do the state budget, but this is just, and, you know, City Hall had suggested that they might be considering this and, you know, I just had a specific conversation uh, about, you know, the fact that the city owes us some material and further conversations before proceeding so that the community can have at least a minimal level of confidence that this is a decision that's being made on a reasonable basis and based on you know the the actual facts of what's possible with this building so it's really again really it, it feels like a, you know a direct um you know the city the city making a decision direct specifically to ignore very specific commitments that were made to us uh last month and you know it's really unacceptable I mean, I think our request is that before we move forward, that we get our meeting with the DDC and that we also get, you know, we get the supporting materials to demonstrate that the city has spent time to truly analyze adaptive reuse as a as an alternative and to demonstrate to us that it's not possible. Um, you know, we've also heard some conversation about that that the buildings are not structurally sound enough to do adaptive reuse. Both Brian and I have asked for supporting materials to demonstrate the engineering report or whatever to demonstrate that that is actually the case. We have not received any of that material as well. So I think you know we're very incredibly disappointed right now with where the you know the what this is what's happening right now. I certainly understand. I mean, uh, we will pass that on to City Hall. Again, this was a collective decision. It wasn't just GDC, but uh, there there were extensive conversations between the agencies represented here tonight about the, the plan forward, and this is the plan that the city has decided to take. And City Hall is aware you're announcing it at this meeting tonight? Yes, it was my understanding that there were some phone calls made the other day. I'm sorry if that uh, didn't occur, but it was my understanding there were phone calls made to the elected officials. Uh, but right. uh, I got a call. I got a call from somebody at City Hall saying they're planning and announcing this. And I said announcing this now would be to announce it without living up to some really basic promises um, that the community uh, was that was made by the city to the community. And this is just again, this is not. You know, it is this is the city's decision, but it is not, a, you know, a reasonable way to engage with either elected officials at all levels of the government or with the community. I did not receive any call from City Hall on this that this announcement was going to be made. I, I apologize on behalf of the team. I, again, I'll, I'm, I'm texting folks from City Hall now so they're aware of the concerns uh, and. You know, I, I will encourage them to reach out again. And if there's something we can do to make this better, we certainly will. Again, the collective plan is to move forward. The way, Jeff, this isn't obviously not your decision by yourself, and I don't mean to personally, <laughs> but the way the way to make this better is for the city to rescind this decision, which is being made in spite of specific commitments that you made six weeks ago. My staff has been following up with the city regularly. I know our my colleagues have as well to get the next meeting scheduled to get the information that you promised and then to get the meeting scheduled. And the city has declined. The city the city is stonewalling us. And you know we all need to work together on a lot of things. And you know everyone in the community I think was frustrated by the prior administration's like, inability to have you know, open and clear communications about what was possible from the from the first time this was announced all the way through the end of that administration. It is unfortunate that, you know, this is this is a this is a bad situation and this announcement is precipitous and directly contrary to what the city had. The commissioner and city hall was represented at the meeting and Department of Corrections was represented at the meeting. And so were many people on this in this call. I mean we can stop it. We should let other people respond. But it's really not acceptable. Yeah, and I'm sure he has something he'd like to add. Yeah. Um, I want to plus one what Assemblymember Grace Lee and State Senator Brian Kavanaugh said. This is extremely disrespectful and truly unprofessional. 
on the way that DDC, the mayor's office, is going about all of this. There were commitments that were made at that meeting that haven't been fulfilled, and our offices have followed up constantly. The community board has followed up constantly. And what we got was we're waiting to figure everything out. And, and there are some things that haven't been released, you know, whether it was the schematics or floor plans that I asked for. So then our own engineers and architects can take a look at it. So then they can make their own independent analysis of whether adaptive reuse can be done. You know, we did a call for an RFP to, for adaptive reuse so we can have an independent person also see if it's possible to actually do it. And I feel like the city has failed. This community has failed to trust the process to, to realize what we can do. Um, and so my team is going to be calling city hall immediately and trying to hopefully get this rescind until more information is provided to elected officials and also to the community board. I think we can also. Okay, I think oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, Lauren. I was just going to say, you know, I know we also had the NAC on Monday. I mean, maybe that's the next forum. You know, this has been a long community board meeting already, but, um, you know, I, I can certainly make sure there are other folks. We can certainly make sure there are other folks available on Monday if, if that's helpful to the elected officials. I think there should okay. definitely be a pause on anything before there's a real discussion with every elected official around the table with the community board chair there as well, before you move forward, even taking a piece off of that building. So how do we move forward? So again, it, that, that I think as the commissioner noted in that meeting on March 2nd, that's not something that he can decide. So uh, we will circle back with city hall. Uh, we can talk further. Yeah, I think what we, can, what we can say tonight, even though I know it's frustrating for everyone, is that we hear you. We hear your frustrations. We will absolutely be, as Jeff said, he's already sharing this information with our colleagues at City Hall, and that's kind of the next step at this point. Well, we, well, I guess you can't tell us if we'll hear, hear anything from you by tomorrow. Before construction or deconstruction resumes, I, that is, you know, that's not something that we can decide tonight. Uh, and if, if something, of course, changes, we'll, we'll let you know, Pat, in the, the resolution. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else would like to say? Yeah, uh, Pat. Jan still has his hand up. Jan, Sorry, who has it? Well, Councilmember Martes. Thank you to everyone who's on the call. I, I, I'm very fortunate to have the representation in our district. As you see on this call from our elected officials, we're also very fortunate that they can actually uh, contain their anger and frustration because they have worked in good faith with the administration and with everyone else who's on this call. I don't have to be calm. I represent my community. We are outraged that this is moving forward. We want to say to you, how dare you come to our community in this way to announce that you are moving forward with demolition after only sending this 10 day notice to a select few people in the community. In, and, and, and when I had asked Nikita about these permits, I got no answer. So record that. I also want to record that we looked at the documentation jeff we looked at the stuff that you provided it does not have anything that resembles a study that says you cannot re adaptively reuse that that is not in the document and that's what we asked for it doesn't exist what our representation has said we want an rfp so that we could formally study the feasibility of an adaptive reuse it is not acceptable the documents that you provided to us because it had a comment not a study, it had a comment. It was someone's opinion in that volume of information that you sent us that just says adaptive reuse cannot be done. And now we hear uh, through a number of different parties that um, these buildings are unsafe and that's why adaptive reuse can, cannot be done. 
There is no study that proves that. We asked you for that at that round table. I want also to record on the record today that all of you are telling us that this is a multi-agency decision. Well, it's a multi-agency decision to move forward with demolition when you have no builder, you have no final budget, you have no final finish date on when you're gonna finish this project. You have no proof that adaptive reuse cannot be done. And you dare to come to this community and say, we're moving forward anyway, after four years of demonstration, good faith discussion, we have representation who has been absolutely stellar in representing our community and dealing with City Hall and dealing with you and dealing with the people on this. And as far as Monday's NAC meeting comes, be prepared because we will come full force on everyone who is moving this forward. We're gonna do it here and we're gonna do it in the streets and how dare you come to this community with this news in this way, in this committee. So I wanna applaud our elected officials for continuing to be patient. I think even with you guys, your patience is shown that you are at your wits end. And I wanna thank you for constantly, constantly bringing this to the forefront and representing us. As I said, I don't have to be calm. This is this is a, a minute expression of what you guys are going to hear from our community if you decide to move forward. And I implore you to stop the demolition, do what you can until we can get to the round table and discuss this again, the way we did before. Thanks, Dan. Listen, anyone Listen, else? I appreciate, um, just want to say, we do appreciate the, um, I mean, I can hear the frustration in your voice, of course, I appreciate the passion that you're bringing to this. Again, as Jeff said, um, we did not think this was the first that certainly the elected officials were hearing about this. So if wires got crossed there, we do apologize on behalf of the city. Um, again, I don't think that there's much that we're going to resolve on this tonight. Um, of course, we, once again, I just want to say we, we hear you, we acknowledge this. Um, of course, we're sharing this back with our partners in the city. And if there's, if there's an update that we can share, we'll let you know. Should anyone else want to make a comment or have a question? Yeah, we have uh, Aura Rosenberg from the public. Aura, you can unmute. And I'll wait till the very end, Pat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's Sammy. Okay. Aura, you're able to unmute now. There we go. Go ahead. Also, it's it's very late. I and I'm a member of the community and listening to Jan, I just want you to know that I feel the same way that he does. And there's so many people who live here who really feel the same way. We feel frustrated, ignored by outsiders who've come here to build this jail. We protested for four years. I think you just need to hear from me, but I'm not the only one. We've tried and tried and tried mm -hmm. and nobody seems to care to listen. As a matter of fact, we were outright lied to by the mayor. So um, just an average resident of the community, we really resent the way you're treading over our desires uh, to protect our community. And like Jan Lee says, how dare you? Thank you. Everyone from the public. Uh, oh, sorry. Silence. You have one more person, but I think Tammy says she's going to go. And then Vera. Vera will go and then Tammy. Yeah, I, I just want to say that, um, no, I'm, I'm not frustrated. I'm actually disgusted with the way this process uh, has gone forward. Lauren, you say that, um, you know, uh, you have you informed the electeds. Well, I know for a fact that Jan, who's not an elected, who is a person living here, and whom you know has actually emailed Nikita over this weekend asking specifically for the status, and there was no answer to that. So again, you, the methodology and the process in which you're, at which the city and you are moving forward on this is just trying to blindside this community, which is completely unacceptable. And I thank God that we have great electeds 
for working hard for us to make sure that this does not happen. And it is very clear to me that the city wishes to move forward so that there will be a community that is left in shambles and a hole in the ground with nothing there and nothing to speak for. And we came forward with a solution. It was a win, win, win solution. We asked you to look at it in good faith and you refused and have not given one good reason as to why you would not look into this. So you know what? This voice is not of frustration. It's of utter disgust. And frankly, you know what? I am not surprised. That is all I wish to say to Tammy at this moment. Okay. Uh, Vera? That was me. Are you unmuted there? That was me. Oh. Are you taking your hand down or do you have something Vera, else? Vera just spoke. That was Vera speaking. Sorry, Vera. It didn't sound like sorry. you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. You probably you don't hear me that angry then often. It's been a long night. All right. So anyone else from the from the public uh <clears throat> Yeah, we have uh, Vittoria Fariello. Vittoria, you can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Indeed. Okay, great. Sorry. I don't usually call in from the phone, but I heard that um, this was uh, this was going on. And I just wanted to say that this is, it's not too late to still do the right thing. Um, we can still do the right thing here. The city doesn't need to move forward tomorrow or the next day. And I think it's important that you pause and you actually think about and talk to the community and actually consider something that is so much more viable and so much more appropriate for what we need and what this community needs, but also what the city needs. So I ask you please think about this and truly consider the plans that the community have put forth. That's it. All right. Um, well, I'm not um, chiming in to respond after every person shares. I just, but collectively, thank you all for sharing. And you know, we're we're here and we're listening. I'm still here, even though I'm not. You know, I don't have new information to share after each comment. So, but just wanted to let you know we're still here. Thank you. And Jeff, you're still here. So I don't. Is there anyone else listening from the community? No, Pat. That was that looks like it's everyone. Okay. So. This took an unexpected turn, but is expected on some level because the community has been asking for this. So all I can say at this point is that you will get back to us as soon as possible. You'll get back to our elected officials. Tammy, you have something you wanted to say. Yeah, thanks. I'm trying to get to my computer to log on, so I apologize for the delay. I'm Lauren. I appreciate the apology. I appreciate the dialogue that you are giving us. But you're representing the city who has decided to not listen to the community. You're representing the city who has decided to move on amongst health concerns, construction, budget delays, budget over. Rides, I'm really at a loss here how city government works for the people of New York when we don't have the jail population that can facilitate the closing of Rikers. We don't have a guarantee. We didn't even get information until under a month ago on what the city had in its CPSD. It's disgusting to have had to have foiled documents for years and then this truly feels as if the city who finally got it to, to sending us the information realized what the problem is and therefore pulled the rug really quickly before the public had the opportunity to hear and be considered 
I can tell you from sitting on the neighborhood advisory committee. Their report and the CPSD is factually wrong. It is untenable and while I appreciate you sitting here and listening and saying very nice platitudes, it changes nothing. And in this case, when the when the citizens of New York are correct and you fail to meet the deadline, it is ridiculously over budget that we will need to pay for and the consideration of the RFP of adaptive reuse and all the feedback that we have given and asked for is ignored. The booby prize will be that the citizens of New York were right. That is not what we elected the mayor for. And with that, I close it. Tammy, I'm going to call a halt to this because I think enough has been said. And obviously, you know where everyone stands, Jeff and, and Lauren. So at this point, you'll get back to us. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Jeff, have a good night. Pat, sorry. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Pat. I, uh, yes, good night. I, we're not closing the meeting just yet. I had, uh, I'm sorry. So, Lucian, we did not hear anything about the uh, collapse. Did you get any updated information? Uh, yeah, I can. Let me go over uh, what I have here. Let's see. All right, so just for the benefit of, of, of retrospect for anyone who's watching this video in a couple of years, uh, yesterday uh, in the early afternoon, a uh, parking garage uh, collapsed on Ann Street, uh, right by the corner of South William. Uh, the uh, parking garage uh, appeared to be uh, full of vehicles. Uh, there were parking spots on the roof. Uh, the first images that we saw were of the roof caving into the building. Um, a number of people were injured. There was a fatality. Um, uh, we heard news reports that it was the manager of the facility. Uh, so our, our thoughts are, of course, with his family and, and, and friends at this time. Um, the, as Pat uh, uh, inquired, uh, there are no uh, impacts uh, currently to um, subterranean mass transit. However, um, the streets in that area uh, will likely be disrupted um, as uh, emergency demolition uh, proceeds. Uh, those streets, as we know, are very narrow um, and uh, DOB is in the process of doing emergency uh, uh, inspections uh, of the buildings um, all around. Um, just to be uh, cautious, um, I actually have a list from DOB of all the, the buildings that have partial and full vacates, as well as the ones that received uh, violations um, for these emergency inspections. Um, also, um, uh, the emergency management has uh, placed light towers. Uh, uh, DEP had put out uh, air monitors, uh, and they have not detected asbestos uh, at this time. So that's a bit of good news. Um, let's see, injuries is a total of eight patients, six individuals with minor injuries, one individual with moderate injuries, and then the one who we spoke about had succumbed to their injuries. Um, the following street closures are likely still in effect. Ann Street between Gold and Park Row, Nassau between John and Beekman, Dutch Street between John and Beekman, Gold Street between John and Beekman, William Street between John and Beekman. 
Um, if anyone has any updates that they've seen any of those streets actually open, uh, that would be news to me at this point. Uh, and I welcome any updates from any of our members uh, or members of the public who are on the ground. Um, and then uh, I will certainly uh, report more as um, as we get more information, but we, you know, the information sources are varied. Uh, we have information coming in from Department of Buildings. We have information coming from Emergency Management. Um, I had called the first precinct right when uh, Tammy had notified me that she caught word of this, uh, and they were already on en route to um, the collapse. So I'm certain that they are extremely occupied right now. Um, the the agencies that are still or are still on the scene um, and, and are currently uh, communicating extensively are FDNY, NYPD, Department of Buildings, Department of Environmental Protection, the MTA, Con Edison, uh, also Pace University and HPD. Um, Pace University has a large dormitory that's adjacent to the building that collapsed. So those students are likely displaced for some time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the, uh, I see that um, Diane had raised her hand. Yeah, sorry, Diane. Oh, sorry, Diane. Tammy. Tammy, is your hand still up? The students are back in the dorms. Okay, They great. reopened the dorm buildings. There is one PACE building that is closed, but the dorm buildings did reopen. When I went past, it was crazy because, you know, I'm on Cliff and, and Fulton and had to walk that way to come home and it, the streets were closed and, you know, the police presence was heavy out there. Um, we are going to have to talk about how, because obviously after the, they've determined what caused the collapse, they're going to have to do a cleanup and that's going to affect our streets and they will remain closed and it also will be affected by them parting the debris out. So that's a conversation to have in the future. Uh, does anyone else have anything they want to contribute, they want to say or ask a question? Nope. Okay. Next month, we also wanted to talk, you know, we wanted to get our someone, either Officer Ford or Nick Aragano in to talk about, oh, I'm sorry, Diane, Fine, you have your hand up. Okay, I was just, I was just going to say it. It's frightening that it reminds me a lot about the uh, the crane issues that we were having years ago, that there's not enough people to. When when this was on the news and they said they were told only a few cars could be on each floor, but yet there were many, many cars on each floor. Nobody inspected that. Nobody responded to that. And now somebody's dead. So it's like. It's kind of scary. I mean, the same thing with the cranes, you know, nobody was expect inspecting the cranes and they were having accidents constantly. So I think that uh, I was a little bit nervous when the police department said, you know, everything seems to be fine. It's really not fine. And I hope this doesn't happen in, you know, lower Manhattan has so much weight on it. And the buildings that are built above garages that it, it's a serious issue. That's all. Thank you. Diane. Diane, uh, I, I know I know this has been a long meeting, but uh, 1 of my neighbors had brought up an issue. I don't maybe it might be for for more for the environmental protection committee, but it seems like there's been like in. All along the west side, there's been like heavy gusts of winds at times, like really strong that that are very difficult. To, it's difficult to navigate. And she she had written to the count, council member Marte, trying to see if there's any kind of way that this, that the city could do wind some kind of wind mitigation. I don't know if the flood plan would address any of of the wind issues. Um, but I'm just throwing that out there and maybe something for a future committee meeting or maybe something with joint with the yeah. protection committee. That's, that's we it. We can talk about it. I think did Lucian reach out to you at all? Okay, so we can talk about this. I mean, one of the issues is we live in a wind tunnel. I look out my window whenever there's any rainstorm or any, you know, activity for weather and I have, you know, a hundred umbrellas that are out here in front because they get 
taken gusts of wind. Hey, I was up at Lincoln Center yesterday. It's another wind tunnel. So I'm not sure exactly what we can do. We can have this conversation though. So but maybe also have... look at what other cities like Chicago and other places that have have dealt with it. My, right. we, it's on our it's on our list, so we will have a discussion about that. Um, Smith. Yes, I just had a question. Uh, I was when I was reading about the uh, you know the situation yesterday. It said like the building had or the garage uh, had uh, some open violations going back to 2003, 2004, 2009. And you know my question is because remember when we were talking about some like like uh, buildings to self-report things, and I was just wondering what the process is. I mean, if you get a parking ticket, or you get a summons for not paying two dollars and seventy-five cents in in the subway. You can't go 20 years without getting, you know, you know, getting yeah. something happening to you or, you know, getting your wages garnished or something like that. So Let's how could have... a, a building like like is it just self-reporting or is there is there nobody like no agency that's following up on that? Because basically, if you have an, an outstanding violation from 2003 and four and there's no repercussion. So, so I'm just curious Lucian about that, Pat. Information. Lucian, can you address that at all? Is it something we have to take to DOB? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really comment on the the schedule of which violations become aggravated and then <laughs> what Lucian, are the that's following a, steps that the well, city well, has to... Well, if, if there's an open finish. violation from 2000, that's a very, very political yeah, I mean, I, answer. If, but 20 yeah, certainly, years. Certainly, like, there, there could be more aggressive in, in, oh, in that, doing that. Too nice, I'm sure there'll be conversations about that. A 20, 20 well, I mean, year open I'm, violation. Speak for them. A 20 year open Fine. violation I, means no enforcement. Forget about the schedule. I, it means no. Yeah. Listen, anyway. we, will, we will ask the question of DOB and see if they can address that at all. All right. Anybody else have anything that they want to bring up? They want to put on the agenda for next month. So we're going to try to get our police officers in here for next month to talk about. We have the open issue of bikes on the sidewalk. We have the issue of uh, they were supposed to do something. Remember, we had at the full board meeting a neighbor who lives on Rector Street, another Tammy who I've been in communication with about smoking in front of the uh, Holiday Inn Hotel and also the Holiday Inn wanted a bike rack installed for the residents there who were messengers and used the bikes. So we still have that on the agenda. Uh, just now people said they wanted to talk about um, the arrest for no ID on the subway. So we'll put that on the list for a future discussion. And if there's any other topic, let me know, let Lucian know. Sammy has a topic. Sammy. You know, I always have something to do. I can. I think that at some point in the next couple months, we should get the New York, the New York State Sheriff to talk about illegal tobacco stores. Because the the licenses that you know they open and the process of how it works, because there are no more tobacco licenses available, which we know, and yet there are businesses that are opening and selling tobacco products unlicensed, unregulated, hookah, and everything else. Um, DCWP is well overwhelmed. And really trying to shine some light on processes that we can go through and how it could work to get enforcement and who who needs to step in when is a super important thing. Um, we been we saw a petition from uh, from a group on Hudson River Park Mamas who is looking to get. A petition about them, an online petition to get them to close. So we had responded back with them about the New York City Sheriff would have to do it and build a case. So I think maybe educating the public. From the New York City Sheriff's office on how you build a case. How, you know, 
last time we had, uh, I forgot whether it was Officer Ford or Nick Aradano here, they told us that they refer to the New York State Sheriff's Department to go in and confiscate illegal goods. So yeah, we can yeah so to them and let's um, let's stop the you know sort of back and forthness of it. Let's get the sheriff's departments in. Let's have a nice finite conversation. Let's make a plan. Let's share it with the other community boards, um, and you know that would be great. Uh, okay, uh, Mimi. And then, did you talk about queue up, which is tomorrow at exec, and hopefully everybody will come. No, what was the queue up? Queue up. Um, I can I can share their their uh, blueprint. It's for open restaurants, and it's uh it's pretty cool. And it includes bathrooms and includes many 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 things. So we're going to discuss it. Um, it was shared out through exec. We'll share. We'll discuss it again tomorrow, and hopefully. Um, Move forward to resolution on that. Maybe it's smiling. All right, so everyone heard that about the bathroom. Anything else, Jamie? Uh, I will tell you that there was a discussion tonight. I was at the Hudson River Park Trust Advisory Council. They are doing a letter, or we, so I'm part of that, about getting cargo bikes and e bikes off of the greenway and asking. For 9A to have a dedicated lane for them taken out of the traffic lanes on the west side of 9A. We're not discussing it here tonight. I'm just reporting <laughs> that it doesn't, and it only is during a certain section of the Hudson River Park Trust area, the bike path and streets uptown, where they have significantly limited room and very wide highway. So, um, oh, Betty had oh. her, some of that at her transportation committee that the cargo bikes are too wide for the bike lane. So too well, bike, bike, the, the state DOT is redoing the bikeway. They're changing the bollards. So they're going to be 48 inches wide. The cargo bikes go 36 to 54, depending on what they are. But either way, um, there was lots of discussion about how enforcement could happen and how, like, with a, uh, to get people to follow the rules, not only are people supposed to be wearing vests and, you know, have the name of the restaurant and things like that, but maybe it's a point of the restaurant needs to have, like, the cars will, when you go through a toll, like an easy pass, maybe each e-bike that works on delivery should have a transponder. So when they blow the traffic light, Not a bad idea. Right. So those are kinds of conversations that enforcement, um, since we don't have any uh, currently really robust, yeah, it could be discussed in here or in transpo. But I don't think it belongs in transportation because transportation doesn't do enforcement. That's NYPD. Well, it may end up here. I mean, Betty and I have talked about this bike, the bike issue is basically going to be here. So with the cops, um, anything Thank else? Tammy? Yeah, Mimi, it's getting late guys. It's 938. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of enforcement, um, it, it just, I'm almost certain that nobody stops at stop signs anymore. I feel like cars it's. Worse now, yeah, cars. I mean, like bikes don't stop at stop signs, which is annoying to me, and I, you know, how I feel about that already. But I, yeah, just like walking down, like coming from Fulton all the way down um, to essentially like the Staten Island Ferry, like nobody stops at a light, at a, not at a light, at a stop sign. I feel like our stop signs just don't do anything. I, I yeah. Like if I'm just walking and they don't even seem used to thinking about stopping at stop signs. So it feels really dangerous as a pedestrian. They don't come to full stops a lot of times, but that's yeah. something and, that you can. And not even almost a full stop. Like they couldn't come to a full stop if they needed to. Rolling stop. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's up with our officer next month. 
Okay, so put that on your list to ask about next month and complain about. Okay. So. Oh, hi, um, just an agenda item to consider if it's too crowded next month, the following month, but to start thinking about adding uh, quality of life for senior issues in this community. I'd like to start bringing that up and, and uh, I can bring an item in and then flesh that out a little more. Okay, yeah, you know, um, give us a topic. We'll, we'll discuss amongst ourselves. <laughs> Don't bring a topic, okay? And we'll see if we need to get um, someone in to help with that discussion, okay? Um, I also have on my list as we were having that very long meeting with about the borough-based jail, uh, what I just wrote down, what is happening in the other boroughs about, I mean, maybe this is something Tammy can answer or Lucian can answer, what's happening in the other boroughs with their potential sites for their jails, everyone except Staten Island. Well, Brooklyn is over budget before it even does anything. And it's not due to be completed till 2029, two years after. It's supposed to empty. Yeah. Right there. So and what about Bronx and Queens? Those sites are a bit different because uh, the Bronx, I believe, was an empty build up site. I don't remember Queens, quite frankly. Um, I just know that we are most closely aligned with Brooklyn in terms of space, size, look, siting, and things like that. And yeah. Over budget and two years behind before they even get going. So where do where does that leave Manhattan? Typical typical for construction. All right, we can have some more. So I don't know what to say. And Mitch, did you have your hand up? Did you have something else you wanted to say? I I just wanted to ask. You had mentioned uh, I think next month you said you're going to put like the uh, the no ID thing on on the trains and and that type of thing on on the uh, on the agenda. Well, we'll have a discussion. I have to talk okay. to Liz about what. And no, I, I have a couple. About. I I had a couple of suggestions that might be a win-win for like kind of a copy on both sides. But if you're going to bring that up next month, then uh, I could give my suggestion next month about that. And, or would you just send us an email, please? Because we're not gonna. It's nine forty-two. No, I said I, I could just I could just bring it up next month when when uh, when we talk about it. And then I just very quickly. I just want to say, Jill. Jill is right about the, uh, you know, you could have like a little dog in your in your in your purse or something like that, and she's totally correct. I, I I wasn't inferring about that. I was just inferring about when you see somebody walking with a dog on a leash and then walking on the train and having the dog sit down in the seat next to them or in the middle of the uh, of the aisle, like just like if you're in the park. That's what I was referring to. Not not anything about you know what's proper. So just but, wanted to clarify. Hudson that. forgives you. Most Thank people you. Don't. Dog is not allowed on the subway. So that, no, but you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know you can't you can't bring a dog in, in like in like a little bag like on the airplanes things like that. It's, it's okay on the subway. I wasn't referring to anything like that, so I don't want to get any dog lovers mad at me. I'm referring to like the totally inconsiderate <laughs> people that think that they're walking their dog in the park. Right. Okay. Please we'll share the video that. illusion that I sent you. It's so cute. Bring this meeting close. And if there isn't anything else that anyone wants to bring up, we're going to close the meeting. We can stop. I stop the recording, Lucian. I thank everyone as always. Lucian, we thank you for all the hard work. Tammy, thanks for coming. I guess you will let us know if we hear anything back from Lauren or Jeff or the mayor. Or is there something else you think we should do to rewrite a res out of the mayor? that we are really disappointed that he has not respected the wishes of the community. I think so, that's a good idea. I actually, if you're willing to go down that road, I think it's it's simple and sweet. And I think we absolutely do one because not only that, but we're, we're waiting. There was a meeting with all the electeds. They promised information and they didn't send it. And it, they didn't send it because they know that they did not, what they told us was a lie. They said, we did a survey. We know it doesn't work. Where's the survey? There is no survey. They're all in a bar okay. right now. Can we bring this up in executive tomorrow? I know We've got a long day tomorrow. We can keep yeah. it super s s simple and sweet if you want. 
Pat, can I just ask Tammy one question about that? Just my own information. Sure. When, when when the construction people were telling like the electeds, uh, as we're speaking, we're we're contacting, we're texting our our colleagues at City Hall to relay your your messages. I would have liked, uh, I you know, for them to like the names of the colleagues that they that are, are like in the next level up that they're texting, like to, just, like to give the electeds or people like you, Tammy, and the heads of the community board and the electeds, the names, be, okay, we know it's the mayor, but what are some of the other names of the people that are in the next level up that, that seem to be the decision makers and give those names to Marte? Mitch, what? Mitch the, we already asked those questions in a meeting. The buck stops at Mayor Adams' desk, the head of, the head of DDC told us that, okay. the commissioner, that that he works at the pleasure of that mayor, and that's who makes the decision. Okay. So if you want to say anything, go speak to our mayor, who doesn't seem to actually want to listen to the people in Lower Manhattan. So when they were saying they were texting some of their colleagues at City Hall, that was that was kind of like a. You don't know what it is. No. Uh, you know, I think I'm just going to. Uh, okay, it's late. I mean, uh, we don't know who they are. We don't know what it was. So I just think that tomorrow we should actually write a reso that is just as blunt as that to the mayor himself and say, yep, we were promised to get this and this and this. You have reneged on your promise. We are very unhappy and we want you to talk to us about what's going on. I don't want him to talk. I want to like. Do, we asked three simple things: do not, you know, do not demo that building, do the RFP for adaptive reuse, and prove to us that it can't be done, because we know it can be. You're already you late. They're already late and over budget. All right. You have a quorum. Okay, we... Pat, if you want to, if you want to, I mean, it's that simple of a resolution. Stop demolition. All right. I mean, hey, I, I would, promise, I would say that to me, with the community before anything further is done, yeah. right? They made a promise. And, and you and use Marte's and and Kavanaugh's and Grace Lee's name, at, you know, in the resolution also. All right. I think we need to call it quits tonight. Tomorrow is my transition to back to Queens. <laughs> we, Thank you. I know we're going to be talking about at Borough Board tomorrow. World peace. <laughs> I didn't get um, the link, but Andrew didn't send me a link for tomorrow for Borough Board. All right. Chase him down. If you have oh, it, everybody's no. hung in there tonight. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thanks. Really appreciate you. Appreciate your advocacy.